This program was recorded on Monday, June the 15th, in the year of our Lord, 2015. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. From the John DeVitter Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Now, here's the guy who started it all, John DeVitta. Thank you, Rich. From the John DeVitta Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, June the 15th, the year of our Lord, 2015. Today the panel will be talking about the Civil War and Chicago. So sit back and enjoy, meet the Chicago historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. Now, here is our panel moderator, Jack Red Ryan. And he Jack? Is. He is red today. Thank you. Donka Shane. What what Melcy? How else can we say that? Here we are in the midst of our monsoon season. And it's I'd like to say it was sunny and bright outside, but not right now. I don't think it's precipitating. Who was the last one to come in? Uh, Rich? Was it still was it raining? It is raining. It is raining. It's building up, yeah. Oh, imagine that. Rain in Chicago in June. <laughs> Things are so green. Especially the rice paddies. I couldn't see if it was precipitating because all that rain was coming down. So. I ran between the raindrops myself. Oh, yeah. boy. Oh, yeah, I know. You're right. Yeah. Well, we oh, gotta oh boy. Yeah, it's even oh, worse brother. than you got to turn the heater on. Yeah, one day it's heat, next day it's air conditioner. What is this? Yeah, Can you do that? Chicago. That's June in Chicago. We've done it. I know we were out in a number of years back in San Diego this time of year, and they were... They were uh, apologizing what they call June gloom because it gets kind of overcast in the daytime. I said, are you serious? You're apologizing for this? It was sunny. It was beautiful. So You apologize to the guy upstairs. <laughs> well, I mean, what's his name? Liz up there? Oh, you mean, oh, you mean the guy. Yes, the guy. Okay. Well, the uh, boss. Can we say that to the program going to a public school? I would think so. <laughs> Remember when uh, that... Uh, that uh, decision about prayer in public school came out, I think it was about 1962. Shortly thereafter, Schultz came out with a Peanuts Sunday comic strip. Charlie Brown, he comes home and he sees Sally, his sister, and says, Hey, are we alone? Are you sure? Oh, he's been looking around carefully. He goes and whispers to her in her, in her ear, We prayed in school today. Now, that was profound, really. Someone said at the time that as long as there are final exams, there will be prayer in the public schools. <laughs> you mean that's on the same on the same basis as there's uh, the same sort of a uh, uh, you know the saying about there are no atheists in foxholes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Same idea. Yeah, n neither one is a very uh, complimentary uh, of the human you know, human nature, I guess. So anyway, thank you folks for listening. We're so glad you're there. We hope you're there, and we hope you have half as much fun as we do. We're going to do a little introduction, Mouseketeer Roll Call, and uh, we'll save our guest star for last. Let's see if we can guess who it is first. Anyway, to my left, sir, Mr. William Kugelman. Yes, well, Bill. Bill. Bill really. Ah, Bill. Uh, spent a uh, few years on the uh, Chicago Fire Department and uh, was president of the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, of which we will have an open house here uh, Where's the calendar? The 27th of June, and that's at 5218 Southwestern mm -hmm. from 10 to 2. Uh, you're welcome to come and bring a camera. Uh, to my left is John S. Kacholko. There we go. And I am a former town assessor and trustee in Cicero, former state representative in the Illinois General Assembly. And a former practitioner of the radio arts on WJJG. And very glad to be here on Meet the Chicago Historians. 
Did you need a license to practice that, uh, John? I don't think so. I think okay. I had a learner's permit. I think, oh, okay. I, think I, I don't think. I think okay. if I'd been there one more year, I would have gotten the license. Okay. You, right. didn't, have, you, you didn't do any, uh, you know, funny works with needles or anything like that? Uh, Not that I can recall. Okay. Not that I can recall. I can remember asking a lawyer one time, how long have you been in practice, Carl? He said, ooh, 41 years. I says, was it about time you quit practicing and got a job then? <laughs> of course, he thought it was very funny. There were doctors, too. Right? And to your left. And to my left is that great radio voice. <laughs> yes, I am your announcer, Rich Lang. <laughs> I've done some teaching of modern European and American history, and more recently a student of Ken Little's Chicago history class at Wright College. So I'm narrowing the scope of my real interest in history to more and more Chicago and neighborhood history. You've got to remember he's not teaching anymore. He retired. This is true. In my mind, he is still teaching. He'll be teaching forever. Yeah. He's uh, he's absent. Now, on the weekend, you just had a... uh, Can you tell us what you do? uh, I'm in a group that recreates old-time radio shows. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, we were at St. John Cantius Church on the near west side. Did a performance of the Green Hornet. Mm Mm-hmm. Generally, though, the audience demands comedies from us, like the Bickersons, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fred Allen, that sort of thing. Boy, oh boy, I bet you just stunned that crowd. <laughs> <laughs> great, the great Gildersleeve, they like stuff like that, I don't know. We bear, hardly ever do him. No? It's hard to get his voice. Yeah. 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 Leroy. <laughs> Leroy, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. The Bickerson's by far then a lot like my favorite husband, that sketch that Lucy did oh. before she s- transitioned to television. Richard in Denny. Yeah, they, they did that as a TV series with Joan Caulfield and Barry, what's his name? No, not Barry. That Barry, was the Barry. movie, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, I mean, it was also yeah. a TV series, Barry yeah. Nelson. Barry Nelson. That sounds right. I remember I was a young lad then watching the. Cause we all were then. We're all we're all, we're all that younger we're in those all, days, that's right? A long you know time what? Ago when you were a young lad. Do you know what other <laughs> credit Barry Nelson has in his in his reper- in his uh, repertoire? James Bond. He was the first to portray James Bond. First on known person to portray yeah. James Bond on was a it television film? special. Yeah. In the fifties. Interesting. Right. And he was James Bond of the uh, of the CIA. By the way, yeah. it was an Americanized version. They did it. They set it in the United States. Yeah. There, there is a version of uh, the life of Ian Fleming, and he did have quite a life. His biography is really oh something oh else. Sure. Uh, all of James Bond movies are portrayed off of his uh, his ex- experiences, exploits, and experiences. Mm. Yeah. And what part did you play, by the way, before we finish up, Rich? What oh, I was the Green. Were you the Green Horn- Hornet? No, I was his father, <laughs> Dan Reed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, mentioning the connection with the uh, Reeds to the Lone Ranger. Right, right. Well, Dan Reed was uh, the Lone Ranger's nephew. Right. I, yes, that's right. That's right. Horn and you know, I just right want to let everybody know our sister station, uh, WRWX 88.1 uh, out of uh, Norwich, uh, plays, specializes in old time um, radio programs all day long, 24 hours a day. Hmm. 88.1 WRWX. Thanks uh, for mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, when I was with WJJG, uh, every Wednesday, uh, we used to have uh, the best of old time radio shows, and the retired mayor from uh, Des Plaines uh, was my partner, Tony Aridia, and we used to do uh, old time radio shows. And if you gentlemen look on the other side of this wall, that those shelves that are right down down the, the aisle right here, uh, those are all tapes of. Uh, Best of old time radio shows: Fibber McGee and Molly, The Alone Ranger, uh, The Pickersons, and uh, uh, all, all the old time radio shows are all on the on the, in the on the shelf right behind the other side of this wall over here. So um, I was in quite quite involved with Best of Old Time Radio Shows. Uh, we did a two hour show every uh, Wednesday on on WJJG hmm. with, with Tony Aridia. John, uh, you, uh, you mentioned Tony Aurelio, and uh, it, it reminded me yesterday I heard that uh, our old friend Tony Emilio uh, is having some uh, uh, physical ailments. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, remember, remember him in your prayers. Oh my God, boy, Bill, you've been a you've been a bucket of good news today talking yeah, about uh, yeah. uh, Father Macron's brother passing away, and now this gentleman and. Uh, yeah, boy, I tell you, Tony was uh, was one of the leaders on the uh, cop talk show. That's right. Yes, uh, yes, yep. Hmm. 
Al, certainly right. next up. My name's Al Olfitz. I'm I retired from the city of Chicago. I uh, one time president of the Austin Urban Community Council and also the local chapter of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And we sort of died because could not get new faces in the place. So it was one of those things. And uh, it was a lot of fun while it lasted. What did Abraham Lincoln say? If I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one or something like that? Is there a quote from you? Uh, they, they got all kinds of cliches with him, but I someone, don't know which ones are true. Someone had accused him of being two-faced. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, he's just because he, he got the Illinois Central Railroad down the middle of Lake Michigan. Uh, other than that. <laughs> anyway, wow. my saying that was a segue into oh. introducing our guest, Pat Butler, who you uh, are a, a Civil War man, correct? I mean, not a, not a, not a veteran of it. <laughs> I mean, uh, Last remaining sure? veteran of it. Um, <laughs> Come on, hardly. let's hear about you. Give us a biography, uh, Pat. Okay, a uh, little bit about my uh, background. I've uh, done uh, a little more than refight the Civil War. Um, yes, I have been a reenactor. As a matter of fact, I was one of the pallbearers at uh, the reenactment of Lincoln's uh, oh. funeral in uh, <coughs> 1995 in uh, Rose Hill uh, Cemetery, mm -hmm. and I'm the guy in some of the in some of the pictures that were taken. They show a close-up of a mouth barking an order, ah. and that's my mouth and. Uh, so I was in that uh, detail. Um, <coughs> the pallbearers were picked because of some connection with either Lincoln or assassinated presidents or the Civil War in general. And uh, I uh, got picked as one of the people by David Wendell, who was the historian oh, yes. at the uh, Rose Hill Cemetery, uh, because I had, for believe it or not, guys, for three years, I dated Mary Todd Lincoln's great grandniece, Good who was Lord. living here in Chicago at uh, the time. I also had uh, a granduncle who was a bodyguard to a uh, president of the United States, uh, McKinley. Yeah. No bad jokes, please. He was uh -oh, not on no duty no. that he day. He wasn't on duty at Buffalo. <laughs> he was not in uh, Buffalo. He was uh, in Washington uh, at the time. So uh, hmm. uh, you can't pin that one on, on him. <laughs> I have been uh, a reporter and editor for the uh, Learner newspapers, which were sold to Pioneer Press. And Pioneer of? Press w took over, and uh, the Sun-Times took over Pioneer Press. I currently work for uh, Inside Publications, which picked up three of the Lerner newspapers uh, that would be uh, The Booster, The New Star, and Skyline. And uh, in, uh, I've also, uh, uh, in whatever time I had, uh, I uh, wrote uh, three books on Chicago history, The Hidden History of Ravenswood Lakeview, uh, The Hidden History of uh, Uptown Edgewater, and the third book, which is coming out at the end of uh, August, The Hidden History of Lincoln Park. Sure. And I'm also the president of the uh, Ravenswood uh, Lakeview Historical Association. So that's, uh, that's what I do for fun. Excellent. You realize, of course, we have a local name here that was quite prevalent in the Civil War. He did three turns. Uh, first time as a foot soldier, second time as an NCO, and the third time as an officer, and came back wounded. You know who that is, don't you? No, I don't. Andrew Dunning. Oh, really? Yep. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that one. He, he brought in all the nuts uh, over to. No, uh, he had nothing to do uh, with the. There. He had nothing uh, to do with the uh, hospital. Yeah. Well, you know, it was more than a hospital. It was also a poor house. Yeah. And it was also a Potter's Field. A what house? Uh, pardon? You say tour? tour a tour poor house. Yeah, tour. A poor house. Sure. T O U R? We do have a website. T O O R H O U S E. Poor. Yeah. Yeah. The poor farm. Oh, poor house. Poor yeah. House. Oh. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> not, not. No, I, wanna, I want to make sure. I thought I said tour, T O U R. No, no, you were thinking of something else. Not me. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> inci <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> speaking of the Civil War, one of the residents at the uh, poor house, poor house. Uh, was a gentleman who was a, actually, he had been a brigadier general in the Confederate Army. He's buried out there. He's buried out there. 
Yeah. Where he, though nobody knows. Yeah. He unfortunately, after the war, as you know, generals on losing sides of generals on losing sides of the war do not get a comfortable pension and do not get jobs and do not end up in the state senate or anything like that. Uh, this gentleman uh, he had nothing uh, after the war, as did many Southerners. He came up to Chicago to try and see if he could improve his lot. That did not happen. He ended up in the uh, poorhouse and uh, died there and is uh, buried, uh, to my understanding, in an unmarked grave. Okay, first of all, one thing you have to remember, the property was originally bought by the Cook County as a cemetery. The first burial was in 1854. The poor house and everything else didn't start until 1872 because of the overfilling of the, I don't want to call it downtown poor house, but they had one at about 40, I think it was 47th in the lakefront at one time through Cook County Hospital. So uh, at that time, they did sweeps, I don't want to call it, of this. Any, any vagrant that was on a street would be picked up. You know, not like nowadays, they didn't have the rights and they were brought to the poorhouse. And some got out because they got relatives and everything else and uh, some didn't make it out. But the problem was they mixed the poor with the uh, tuberculin with the insane and consequently you got a real nasty mix there. So it, uh, but it, it got so bad because of, of uh, politics that the state took it over in, in 1912. What happened in between that time is actually they ordered, they were uh, selling bodies to uh, medical schools, unauthorized of course. But they you're, you're saying there was political corruption in Chicago? That was even worse than now. Oh my God, it's hard to believe. It really, it really <laughs> hard is. to believe. Yes. But they, they actually, it was, uh, uh, I don't know how well documented it is, but there was a case of uh, they wanted a certain type of physique, and they one of the patients came in, fairly strong person. He was not really insane. Within a couple months, he was dead. Hmm. And his body would all of a sudden disappeared. <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein or something was going uh, on? Whatever, but... Uh, well. Well, I, uh, the, the information that I had, there's over uh, 4,200 Confederate prisoners that were were uh, here in Chicago yeah, buried mm -hmm. in a mass grave at Oakwood Cemetery yeah. after the war, and the war ended in 1865. Mm -hmm. So when was that then that uh, okay, the, the prop, poor the house? Prop, the catch on that is that, that was the... the internment area because that was also the uh, stockade Camp or, Douglas yeah it's Camp mm -hmm. Douglas yeah there is there is a uh, black family over there that maintains a memorial to that uh, site and he does fly the Confederate flag Griffin funeral home okay yeah yeah, yeah right and I asked him how come he said he said whether you liked it or not it's part of history of course it is yeah it's mm -hmm. part of history for sure. But, but the fact was that uh, Mount Olive Cemetery does have uh, some graves there of uh, Civil War soldiers. Rose Hill has them. Uh, Dunning has them. I'm not sure how many, but there is a website called uh, cookcountycemetery.com. It gives you a lot of history of it. And I also maintain a face page called 38 Souls Forgotten, the Reed Dunning Memorial project mm -hmm. so it, it we try to keep up on it but i'm i'm the lone ranger on that so well, i i'd like to go uh, you know that's yes they're unknown but how about these 4200 uh, prisoners thrown into a mass grave that's, that they should be remembered too and as you say uh in oakwood cemetery if they keep it up god bless them uh uh you know this well, camp douglas must have been a nothing but a uh, well, it was a detention camp, but it was loaded <coughs> with uh, with disease. Overloaded, and, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Overloaded. bad sanitation. Oh, yeah. Big how, overloaded. How you? And you know what? They in, in other camps around 
the country during the Civil War, they would have maybe 20, 30, 40 uh, at the most that were that were uh, that were ended. Their lives were ended. Mm -hmm. But here at Camp Douglas, it was like 40 percent mm -hmm. of those that were interred there that well, were. That were yeah, Pat, dead. you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, in fact, the uh, prisoners at Camp Douglas uh, have been remembered and were remembered uh, probably 10 years after the war. There is a fairly large monument at Oakwood Cemetery, right. mm -hmm. and it lists the names of each of the Confederate soldiers. And they had, unlike <laughs> soldiers brought off from the battlefield, they had the names because of the records at uh, Camp Douglas. Uh, last summer, uh, a professor from uh, DePaul University and some volunteers began an excavation program there. And they started to dig up stuff uh, on the former site of Camp Douglas. What they plan to do is have a kind of a living museum and monument to Camp Douglas. And they're gonna have the artifacts that have been dug up. And so far, they've dug up buttons, they've dug up belt buckles. Uh, I believe they dug up a sidearm, um, things like that. Now, Camp Douglas, I mean, we like to think of, uh, you know, we Yankees as the good guys and all of that. But when you think of prison camps that were atrocious, you normally think of uh, Camp Sub Sumter, otherwise known as Andersonville, uh, which was so bad that uh, the commandant of that camp was hanged as a war criminal after the Civil War. Wurtz. I hasten, Major Henry Wurtz. Wurtz. I hasten to point out that had we lost that war, there might have been war crimes trials held after the war because Camp Douglas and a couple other places, uh, Elmira, Elmira in New York, Elmira, New York. Uh, these places were so bad, I am sure that uh, even uh, officers of some foreign countries that we fought in World War I and World War II would blanch at the conditions that these people lived under. Uh, part of it, it is argued, was unintentional, unavoidable, because the United States had never fought a full-scale war since the Revolution, uh, or the War of 1812, but even those on American soil. Even those wars were tiny by compared by to this. Uh, no, no, yeah. we, no, one was, no one north or south was prepared no. for, for what they would be dealing with in the Civil War. Right. No one had given any thought to prisoner of war camps or right. anything. So everything was all being made up as they went along. And, and as a matter of fact, at the beginning of the Civil War, if prisoners were caught by either side, they'd be held for a couple of weeks and then released on parole, parole. Mm -hmm. with the understanding that they not fight again. And uh, in most cases, the, this agreement was kept, but there were violations. Because of that, uh, Mr. Lincoln suspended the parole agreement and started holding these people. We were not prepared to handle the large numbers of prisoners. In the first place, in those days, nobody knew much about sanitation. In the second place, the guys who were selected to run the camps in the north, not just Camp Douglas, were generally officers who had no aptitude for much of anything else. You know, they may have had an uncle who was a politically connected person who got mm -hmm. them a commission and they had to do something with these guys so they had them running prisons. And that was very that was commonplace in the Civil War. So many of the commissions were state commissions they and, were. They, and they were politically yeah. uh, well, arranged. A lot of our volunteer soldiers so they had no concept of what was going on. Right. The local bigwig mm -hmm. would raise a company or a regiment and he right. would become the captain or the colonel and that was it. Well here's the thing. If you if you bankrolled a regiment in the Civil War, if you were a wealthy man and you decided to pay for the expenses of raising and equipping a regiment, you were automatically made the colonel. Right. You would have a lieutenant colonel under you who presumably knew what he was doing, probably from some experience in the Mexican War, if you were lucky. But 
<laughs> not uh, not always that because uh, commissions were were bought and, and arranged for go ahead I think we're all familiar with that sort of an operation having <laughs> worked in you know various uh, fields of the uh, local governments we've seen people like that who got the position who had the underling who knew what he was doing right it has happened. But this guy gets the dough. Yes. Well, yeah. here, the, and, yeah. and, 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 and my looking this up on this Wikipedia, there was a guy by the name of Judge Fuller who was a, a judge and naturally a political uh, uh, appointment. And he was, uh, was not an engineer. And he chose Camp Douglas. Uh, you know, and realized later on it was a poor choice because it was wet. And, and, you know, low-lying all the time, and it lacks sewers. Uh, it, it just, uh, oh, that was, that was uh, it was all the sure. waste and, uh, of humans and horses. Mm -hmm. The camp flooded with each rainfall. Mm -hmm. In the winter, it was a sea of mud. And when the camp opened, only one water hydrant worked. Mm -hmm. So you know that, that this is sounds like a typical well, political uh, appointment that uh, a guy was given a gift. And he didn't know what the hell well, to do you, with it. You got to remember, first of all, Chicago was a swamp. In yeah. general. Well, that's what he's saying here. Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. uh, any any place yeah. in Chicago would have been yeah. a bad choice. Another thing is that uh, armies didn't deal with their own wounded on a much better level than they did with prisoners of war because, right. Right. as you mentioned, we they didn't have the knowledge of hygiene. They didn't know about infection. They were a few years away from learning about germs and everything. So smallpox so was so they was didn't. One of the they just didn't killers. have the technology or the or the know-how to to provide the kind of of an environment we would expect today. Right. Well, the only one I would say that where atrocities were worse or just as bad was uh, Japan. The prisoner of war there were. Oh, you're talking World War II. Yeah, but at still, which point you look, people you're knew better. At the, yeah, it's a hundred years difference. Yeah, people knew better by the 1940s. That's le they, it's less of an excuse in the but, 1940s. Yeah, there was no excuse, but they yeah. still they had the baton death march. Yeah, well, that was right. that was just cruelty. Yeah. I mean, that was just cruelty, pure and simple. Yeah. Seven or eight Japanese officers were executed over that later oh, yeah. war uh, crimes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, including one of them, uh, General Yamashita who was the commander of the Philippines area, and he was executed not for actually <coughs> having signed any orders, but because of the fact that this happened in his area under his watch. Yeah. And the argument was that as their commander, he should have known what his men were right. doing. Yeah. So uh, he, was, uh, he was executed even though he could not directly be linked to any war crimes. Another thing about Camp Douglas and Chicago, as you may have noticed, we do have vicious winters here in Chicago. Nah. <laughs> These in Chicago? No. <laughs> First political corruption and now bad weather? My, I, that's I, I, hard I to this believe. Is, this is time for all of our listeners to grow up and, and, and be aware of the real world. <laughs> but uh, these Confederate soldiers uh, were issued light uniforms because they were from the South. Yeah. They come up here, and if they were lucky, uh, people would give them, come in and give them warm clothing. You know, civilians would give them warm clothing. But it got to the point there was so much of a the commandant of the camp felt there was a problem with too much coddling of the prisoners. So he threatened to arrest anybody who brought food or mm. clothing to these prisoners. Again, the type of stuff that if we had lost that war, and incidentally, mm -hmm. that victory was not assured from the start. There was an excellent possibility that the South was going to win the war, or at least by a negotiated settlement. I would disagree. Yeah. Well, okay, would disagree. I'll, I'll go into that with you. Forgive me, but I would disagree. Later. Okay. We, got a, we got a break here, too. Well, thank you. Okay. Got a little, got, got time for a break there, John? You want to go ahead. Okay, now <laughs> for a brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Well, friends, now that the warm weather has arrived, it's time to plant your flower and vegetable garden. It's not too late to start planting your flowers and vegetable gardens. 
and I have just the right place for you to go. Get your flowers and vegetable plants. You can go to Pesky's Flower Gift Shop Garden Center and Greenhouse, which is located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. Pesky's has a very large selection of flowers, vegetable plants, and much, much more. Whatever you need for your flowers or vegetable garden, you can find it at Pesky's. And once again, they are located at 170 South River Road. They are just north of Route 14 or Minor Street and south of Golf Road, which is Route 58, on the west side of River Road. And be sure to stop in and visit their flower and gift shop. Again, Pesky's Flower Gift Shop and Garden Center, located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. River Road is Route 45, and they are on the north of Route 14 or Minor Street and south of Golf Road or Route 58. You can call Pesky's at area code 847-299-1300 for more information. Again, that phone number is 847-299-1300 or they're located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. Now back to our special edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. Before we here, yeah. are we still there? Are we on? Yeah, before we get back to Civil War talk, Civil War it, talk? Is, it, is, it is our custom usually we get into what we call recent history or current events, and we got a few things going on. First of all, John, can you come out a minute? John DeVita, please. Uh, Saturday, Fire Academy. Fire muster, is that what they call it? Yes. Yes. Can you explain? Yes, yes it's, it's a fire muster. What it is, it's, um, it's a, uh, a, fi a fire nomadic swap meet. Uh, anybody who is interested in, in, in the fire service and the fire department, uh, we come to the academy, uh, which is located at 558 to Colvin Street, right at the corner of uh, Jefferson and Taylor. And we have vendors that to sell all kinds of fire nomadic items, like uh, T-shirts with the fire department logo on it, uh, books. Uh, we have uh, vendors that sell uh, lights and sirens and uh, radios and uh, uh, all kind anything to do with the, with the fire department, uh, th it's on sale. It's, uh, it's at the Fire Academy once again. It starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. We also have a fire display. Uh, some, some townships and some villages uh, bring in their old fire apparatus. Uh, the fire museum uh, brings in their um, some of their antique equipment, the, the water tower and uh, their their old engine, and then they have a competition um, who who can uh, hook up to the hydrant the fastest, and then they have uh, different uh, hooking up the uh, hooking up lines into the snorkel or into the water tower or, or whatever. So it's quite a quite a, a very interesting day. Uh, we have a parade of all the old time fire apparatus. It starts about 9:30 in the morning. It goes around the fire academy down um, down uh, uh, Clinton to uh, Roosevelt, and then back down uh, Jefferson back to the academy. Uh, the mission is free. All you have to do is just be a lover of fire service. Bring a camera. Bring all oh, definitely bring a camera. We do serve um, refreshments. Uh, we have uh, hot dogs and chips and pop and um, all kinds of goodies that's in the in the uh, inside the fire academy in, in the lunchroom. Uh, once again, uh, the admission is free and uh, bring your camera. Bring the kids. Bring grandma and grandpa. Bring everybody. The. Uh Fire Fire Academy is located on DeCoven, which is where right okay, off of Roosevelt. Okay, okay. Um, the the Fire Academy is located at 558 DeCoven, and of course it's just a just a very small street because that's where the Great Chicago Fire started back in 1871, and it's at it, the the Fire Academy is right on the corner of Jefferson and Taylor and Taylor and Clinton. So it's, it's south of the Loop, west of the Loop. 
Yeah, Near south south of the loop. It's right off the uh, Kennedy Expressway. If you're going, uh, s uh, if you take the Kennedy Expressway, for, like from up up this way here, from uh, Norwich or the north side here, you go down the Kennedy Expressway, go all the way, get off at Taylor at the Taylor Street exit, get up to the top of the ramp, make a left hand turn, and park your car. Now it's you said there will be refreshments there. Yes. Now considering now this is the fire rally, will there be fire water? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Oh. <laughs> I had to say that one. Oh. Uh, oh. Just like Tom McKenna would say, Ooh. that's John. John that John was Ryan. that was that was Jack Ryan. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, if I, you're having a hard that. time finding it, just look for a little old lady holding a lantern and a cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't, right. they, didn't they clear the cow a few years ago in a, yeah. uh, a mock trial yeah. or something? So anyway, so Peg Leg Smith or somebody. It's, it's a great, it's, it's a great day. It's, it's, it's a great day. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like, like I said, guy walk running away with a peg leg. You know who he is. Uh, it's a great day. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of vendors are there. A lot of st people sell their, uh, like I said, T-shirts and statues and anything to do with the fire department. But I want to see this parade and bring the kids down to see yes, that. They'll, yes, they'll love yes, yes. Sure. That's about 9.30. About 9.30, yes, John. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, of course, I'm quite involved with it. I'll be there all day Friday setting up the PA system at the academy. Now, you're um, past president of? Yes, the pa I'm past president of the 511 Club. Which is what? Tell yeah. people. Okay, yeah, 511 Club is an organization that does welfare work for the Chicago Fire Department, such as a fireman gets injured in the line of duty at the scene of a fire. We give him a gift certificate that he can uh, go to a, a local food store and pick up uh, food, or uh, or we send him a basket of fruit that he can enjoy while he's home recovering. If and he gets injured at the firehouse, then we give him a gift certificate that he can go to his local food store to pick up uh, some food and some stuff. Is this our, our our way of saying that you know that we're there to, we're there for for the firemen? If a fireman gets killed in the line of duty. The 511 Club has a firebox, like the firebox you see on the street corners. It's made out of a floral piece, and the president of the organization presents that firebox to the family. And I have done that all too many mm -hmm. times while I was president. And, and don't forget, John, uh, at every extra alarm fire, or, or uh, uh, in fact, now even with the police, yes. the police have a, a standoff, a mm -hmm. hostage situation. Uh, the 511 Club canteen comes That's right. and and gives us coffee, tea, milk, uh, That's right. uh, whatever they have rolls and have, so have, forth. We have and two. They, I tell you what, they they do a marvelous job. Yeah. My 46 years on the job, uh, I've seen them a lot and appreciated them yeah. much more. Yeah, I have, have, a, I have a story about that one. We have we have two canteen trucks. Uh, we have one that's uh, located at Elston and Roscoe, uh, engine 106 quarters, that's Canteen 1, and Canteen 2 is out on the far south side of Chicago at Engine 80's house. That's right. out there, way out there, out there. And also, uh, Jack, I, I know what you're going to say, I'll just give you one more moment. There's, once a year, the 511 Club honors firemen and paramedics for an act of bravery they done beyond the call of duty. The city of Chicago presents uh, presents award number one to, to the most to the most uh, uh, person who did the, the biggest one. The 511 Club uh, does uh, second and third place. So our hearts are out for the Chicago Fire Department. And uh, I've been president of the 511 Club three different three different times. My last. My last run was from 1997 for 12 consecutive years. Wow. You, you and, uh, uh, honored me a couple of times. That's too, right. John. Yes, that's uh, right. I have. And I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, w nice. it's a great organization. We're all volunteers. Nobody gets paid uh, for, uh, for anything that we do. And like I said, I hope the heck the weather is going to be decent this uh this uh, uh, Saturday for for this for this uh, for this for this doings. Yeah, right, yeah. So again, yeah. We'll so we'll um, talk to Rabbi Wolf and see <laughs> what he can do. <laughs> I hope so. But anyways, it's at 5:58 to Coven this Saturday. Uh, admission is free. We do have refreshments uh, for a charge and uh, hot dogs and chips and pop. In fact, if you go outside and look in the back of my truck right now, I got about 25 cases of soda pop that I just picked up for, for the... Um, well, bring some in here. <laughs> I wish. For the law firm. Uh, anyway, so... Right okay. What we're saying before about the canteen truck, uh, as 
strange things happen sometimes. My first full month signed on the street, I was went got out of the police academy in 67, December, assigned to the old 2nd District at 4802 South Wabash. First whole week on the job, first day working alone, it was like 6.30 to 2, uh, night power watch they called it. I get a fire around midnight or something like that. At uh, well, the, con fire con the control was at 47th Indiana. Well, the canteen pulled up. Well, John was there too. Of course, we didn't know each other then. We we're both a lot younger, though, weren't we? Yeah, that's right. We were <laughs> 47 years younger old. and wise. <laughs> yeah, oddly enough, you know, we actually had crossed paths. So, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, very good to get a cu hot cup of coffee. Cross paths with a vehicle. That's really weird. You got the car pulled up in the middle of the intersection. The, the, we had the single bubble gum light at the time going, and people go. Can we get through? <laughs> Can we get through? <laughs> and uh, just just to let tell you about the canteen trucks. Uh, like I said, we have two of them. In the summertime, like weather, like we have today, we'll be serving Gatorade and and cold cold drinks. Uh, in the in the winter time, uh, we have uh, hot chocolate, hot coffee. We have uh, granola bars, and and generally, if it's a big fire and and it's a really a uh, hot or a very cold day, the Chicago Fire Department to come the, the Officer or the person in charge of the fire will, will, will order a uh, a bus to the scene of the fire. And in the winter time, the CTA comes out with what they call it a warm up bus. The bus is parked near the canteen truck. Firefighters or police officers or emergency workers can go get a cup of coffee or get something from the canteen truck. Go sit in the in the bus yeah. and warm up, or vice versa in 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 the winter time. Oh, that's so a good uh, idea. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where was it that night in January? Pardon? <laughs> it was there. <laughs> no, I don't remember seeing that yeah. one. There. But anyway, well, anyway, and a lot of this, and a lot of this stuff was was my idea. I worked with uh, with all the fire commissioners, uh, Commissioner Joyce, Commissioner uh, uh, Hoff. Uh, we worked. I worked with all of them, and we came up with ideas. And and like I said, it was it's all for the good of the Chicago Fire Department. And like Bill's just said, now we are involved in helping the police department. So. Um, our hearts are out there for the for the guys on the streets who risk their life to save to help and save us. Which kind of brings us into the next part about in recent uh, history our current events with this police business going on. Now we just had a armored vehicle attack. Oh God! Yeah. Oh yeah. It was it yeah, Dallas police right. headquarters? Yeah. They, you know? The guy was a little flicking. His father was on a TV crying and all the stuff he lost his son and grand uh, his grandsons with his mother. And apparently the guy had a little problem called domestic violence and a few other things. He took it out in the cops. He armored his van. Apparently he had some explosives in there, too. Yeah. And, uh, Pipe bombs. Yeah, well, yeah. boo-hoo. Yeah, right. Uh, and, uh, the, but anyways, the big they, thing they, coming out now is that, is that this Washington group uh, does not want to have the police have any uh, armored vehicles, yeah, right, military right. vehicles. Because we're talking here's about a, Obama. Here's a guy yeah. that used an armor, a used mm -hmm. armor vehicle that he bought on eBay or wherever it was that he bought it. And uh, uh, thank God they had a good, good SWAT guy there. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Obama doesn't want him to use uh, excess. Uh, mi military vehicles, or or or, or uh, that's what I'm saying, yeah. the Washington group, because well, well, police departments well, have well, had yeah. to do Obama. that because of the threat that it they will face. escalate. Yeah. It will, people yeah. won't be offended if you yeah. come in well armored and protected. Yeah. And I don't understand what that's supposed to mean. Yeah, the but the uh, the bad guy can have AK-47s, but uh, right. no, we we are not allowed mm -hmm. to have uh, military uh, weapons. Well, remember that incident? I think it was in Los Angeles, well, four or five years ago now. Uh, there was some kind of a standoff, and the police on the scene actually went to a gun sh to shop to get better firepower. Yes, yes. Remember that? The yeah. FBI did that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Went over there. That's yeah. quite some time <laughs> well, What's the nice yeah. about Obama, though? He's only oh got God. less than two years ago. Hmm. Well, well, boy, <coughs> will he uh, act for two years. You sure are, you sure are a guy who can see the brighter side of things. <laughs> <laughs> are we going to have a country left in two years yeah. at this point? Yeah, I hope so. But Domestically? And I, well, Obama's trying his hardest to be one of the worst presidents around. So, mm -hmm. 
Well, we don't want to get partisan, but uh, well, he's making Jimmy Carter look mighty good. Yeah. <laughs> he's not trying. He's uh, succeeding. Making Franklin Pierce look good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, how and that's a major <laughs> achievement. Oh, but you <laughs> must also, don't forget James Buchanan. Buchanan, oh. yeah. Buchanan, that's the other guy I was talking about. There's one guy out with, uh, he's trying Buchanan to. Buchanan was not as bad as Pierce. Yeah. Well, know, Buchanan talk. could have ended the Civil War before it started. Really? Well, how, yeah. How, how so? How so? When oh, South sure. Carolina on December 20th, 1860, seceded from the Union. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was the second secession. In 1832, uh, South Carolina's legislature uh, was ready to secede. Andrew Jackson, was who was president. then president of the United States, said, let them secede. I will send the army down, and we will hang the entire legislature. To the he, nearest tree or something. He meant it. Yeah. To the yeah. nearest yeah. tree. Yeah. Um, and he meant it, and he actually mobilized the army and was ready to go down. <laughs> then South Carolina's legislature decided to forbear a little bit and see if this couldn't be handled. This was <laughs> because of a nullification law where South Carolina's legislature tried to pass a law Terrible. giving them the right to overturn any federal law in South Carolina that they didn't like. Ooh. A group of a group of Southern uh, politicians met with President Zachary Taylor in 1850 and threatened secession. Mm -hmm. And Taylor told them, and he was a Virginian, and Taylor, of course, was a general in the war with Mexico. Yes, and Taylor told them that, that if there were a secession, he would personally, as commander-in-chief, lead the army south and hang the first secessionists that he found personally. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> ended, that ended the secession. Yeah. See, both of those secessions, South Carolina and the one that you're talking about in 1850, were nipped in the bud because we had a president Forced. at that time who was not afraid to take the initiative. I seem to have been lost along the way here now. <laughs> Buchanan, Buchanan sat, uh, sat on his coattails, and from December 20th, 1860, to April 14th, 1861, when Fort Sumter was fired mm. on, did absolutely nothing. We have to understand a couple of things. Buchanan believed that secession was illegal and unconstitutional. He also believed that as president, he had no power to do anything about it. So he was in the perfect position of saying, this is wrong, but I can't do anything about Some it. Some of our best presidents have, have been in that quandary, and they have taken the position, I don't know if I have the power or oh, not. I'll do it, and if the Supreme Court corrects me, but it'll so be. But that it, was no. not James Buchanan was a career politician who had held virtually every office you could hold as a public. He'd, he'd served in the legislature, the House, the Senate. He'd he been ambassador to Great Britain. He had been Secretary of State. He had punched his ticket all along the way without showing any great distinction in any of the jobs that he ever did. He was just a typical career politician who got along by going along. He was not a decisive man. As he was he was just not going to do the things that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about Obama again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's, here's, the, here's a guy, you know, there's a list of presidents coming out all the time that from the greatest down to the worst. And Buchanan's usually at the bottom. He's just about right. right bottom. Yeah. Yeah. But and Pierce, I think, was even worse. Well, there's one guy out there. He's, I forgot his name now. He's going to prove, he's going to work on a, on a book to prove Buchanan being the worst of the presidents, so he says he's at the bottom. He wants to make sure he stays at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> when when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, uh, and Franklin Pierce was a northerner, he lived in New England. His home showed no sign of mourning, no mm -hmm. flag at half staff, no no mourning wreath on the door. There was a mob that stood, in, and he was known to have been sympathetic to the South. Mm -hmm. A mob surrounded his house, were threatening to burn his house to the ground if he didn't do something to demonstrate some bereavement over the loss of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And you know, he really had, I mean, I'm sure that, that Pierce had no great uh, sense of loss over Lincoln dying because he was politically opposed to Lincoln. Jack, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the recent history here and, and what's in the paper and that, and I just looked here at the uh, uh, Camp Douglas and uh, it says that it was uh, the barracks there were designed for about 95 men, but the average 
barracks held 189 men. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And uh, I wonder if those are the barracks that the people from United Airlines had to sleep in last night. It sounds uh, like it. Uh, yeah, that was you know, that was our, that with was the Civil a, War. Yeah, according, it sounds, uh, that was no, the, that was Gander, Gander, Newfoundland. Gander, Newfoundland. Yeah, yeah that, that was an old base, though. I thought. Yeah, they you hear about that in the old w- movies, Gander, Newfoundland. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. flew through there when the first airline trip I took. My dad took me to Germany, and it was a night. An arduous trip. You went from Chicago to New York, New York to Gander, New Finland. From Gander, you went to Scotland. From Scotland, you went to Germany. Was that on the, on the, on the Hindenburg or something? I, I, I think Jimmy Stewart is still flying a B-36 <laughs> out of Gander in Newfoundland. He's got a, got a squadron of them up there. Oh, but before we get off the subject, Buchanan, I, one quote I heard was, I'm the last president of the United States. Did yeah, he, he say supposedly something? supposedly muttered that, I am the last president. You know. Yeah, he is at the bottom of the front of the list. Yeah. You know. But anyway, uh, he was the guy, didn't he play Uncle Joe on Petticoat Junction, too? <laughs> <laughs> that was his well, great nephew, Edgar. No. But, yeah. but uh, if you ever see that movie with Jimmy Stewart with the uh, Strategic Air Command, all the veterans of World War II admire him because of the fact he was a pilot. He had several B-29 flights. B-29 pilot in World B-29. War II. Yeah. Who's that? Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart, Stewart and, 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 and Strategic Air Command. He retired he as a uh, general. Well, you mean the real Jimmy Stewart? Oh, I thought I meant the character. Yeah, he he really was an Air Force, yeah, Army Air Force, Air Force officer. Yeah. In World he, War II. When he took off in the B forty seven, he knew how to fly. Yeah. So he did all the requisite things that the pilot was right. normally did, Didn't he lose a son in Vietnam conflict, too? I think he did, yes. Yeah. Yes. And he retired eventually as a Brigadier General right. in the U.S. Air Force. Yeah. Hmm. He, he was very much admired. When when Ronald Reagan was inaugurated, he and and General Omar Bradley, he he was he was like the escort of Je- Bradley was in a wheelchair at that point, and Jimmy Stewart pushed Bradley in a wheelchair in un- still in his full uniform with his five stars, to uh, to pay tribute to Reagan having just been elected president of the United States, and Stewart was in his Air Force uniform as well. Well, Bradley mm-hmm. was the last five star, uh, five last star living general. five star yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think there'll be another one either. From what no. it sounds like, no, I don't think they. There would have to be. Another, there would have ma- to be a major war, war yeah. and let's hope we don't have that. I pray. Well, if these guys behave themselves, they they may be up well, for it, but uh, they don't seem to be <laughs> behaving. Well, what do we do when a, uh, an organization claiming to be the caliphate of a new uh, going to be the big cheese? They they declare war on us. We just ignore this. I mean, is that? Uh-huh. Proper. Uh, well, World War II was actually to some degree like that. You know, it was. Uh, the United States didn't declare war in Germany. Germany Germany's more or less declared war on us. Yeah. yeah. Well, after the attack of Pearl Harbor, then we responded with right. we we, we yeah. the yeah. same day we we that we issued that was a operation. political thing. Sure, right after Pearl Harbor. Hitler what else were they going to do? They and then two days it. later, we declared war in Germany and yeah. Italy. Yeah. No, 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 no. It was oh. the same day. We, we, the same day. I that don't think the, so. No, it was. It was the same day. Uh, Germany, well, I don't think though. It was. You were on. The war. Uh, it was December the 11th, four days later, Hitler declared oh, yeah, war on the that. United yeah, States. That's what you just said. Hitler de- and but we declared war the same day that Hitler declared war on us. But it's a different time no, zone. There was no gap in the days. Though. It was on December the 11th. <laughs> yeah. There's there supposed to be an next. You didn't have a quartz watch. <laughs> Anybody uh, thinks they know World War Two? Go to an encyclopedia or a listing in a. Uh, and look at all the countries who actually declared war. Not just were sympathetic. Now, I don't say that uh, Ecuador had a lot of uh, uh, troops in the fight or whatever. Well, but most they of the Latin American countries. But they declared. Yeah. And like, uh, World uh, War I, too. Most of the Latin yeah, American countries followed us in World War One. I. I know. I did a report on that in eighth grade. Mexico, so s- Mexico and Brazil, I think, actually sent troops overseas. Well, Brazil was very active in the yeah. Atlantic. I know. Um, yeah. um, but m- the, I did some kind of report about World War Two, and then... And all the countries declared, and sister says, "Well, of course, John's talking about all the country with their sympathy." And I, she wouldn't let me talk. I was well sister, go to the damn encyclopedia, will you? Well, you got to look at too that uh, South America, even though they may have declared war, uh, they were not. A lot of them were not that active. No, they had the. They were expressing their solidarity yeah. with the United States. That you know they were on the same side. Because they had the were. Bismarck came into port there, and uh, actually they wouldn't allow no, them to the port. The Graf Spee. Graf no, the Graf Spee. Yeah, Graf Spee. Yeah, the, yeah, it was no, the, the pocket Bis- battleship. Bismarck never made it to, to Latin. Okay. It was, the Graf, Spee. It was a, uh, the Graf Spee. They scuttled it in Montevideo yeah. Mont- Harbor. Mont- Montevideo. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was was quite a uh, 
Pug Pocket Trail, and one of the episodes of uh, yeah. Victory at Sea, didn't you about yeah. that? That was one of the first engagements of the war. That was early in the war. But we weren't in the war yet then. Late we? Oh, no, no, we were. No, that we was the British, no. British Navy. You know, but let me, let me get Navy. back to uh, uh, current events. Good. Uh, my uh, granddaughter uh, asked me the other day to, a couple of days ago, to take her to a movie, and uh, uh, her and and uh, uh, my daughter came along, and the name of the movie was uh, Spy. Oh yes, yes. With yes. Melissa McCarthy, and uh, we sat there in the AMC, and I thought I was in the firehouse uh, again, uh, with uh, with, uh, and, and I don't want to bum rap the firehouse, but. Uh, well, let's say I was at a Navy yard with all the Navy mm -hmm. sailors. I never heard so much uh, cussing and swearing. And, and uh, did any of you guys see that? Uh, yes, movie? I did. did you? No, not yet. Yeah. Uh, I have to. I have to admit, it was the funniest movie I had seen for for in a, a man, long time. But a, but a thirteen year old. No, that's something. Granddaughter. Else. Yeah. I and yeah. And and she was you know looking and. My daughter and I were looking at her. <laughs> kind of embarrassing, huh? And, 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 and then they, they had all of the the uh, previews. I, they call them something else now. And one of them coming out was uh, even worse than that. Uh, a trailer. A trailer. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this one was coming out. Uh, and, and I know I, I heard my daughter tell, uh, tell uh, her, her daughter, you ain't seeing that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was that? I, I, Pat, I don't remember. If I do remember, I'll break uh, in. Uh, but yes. then we saw, um, uh, what's the one? Uh, uh, Jurassic World. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I didn't realize that there was a one. Uh, that there was a two and a three. Yeah, that's about the fourth one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the fourth. It's been a number of years, though. And I tell you Park. what, I sat there. And I I marvel over how they do that yeah. with yeah. with the the animals well, that's and with these, all these of it. These pictures are all their special effects. They're all animation. It's all special mm -hmm. effects. There's no yeah. there's you know, no 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 no. That's not true. I wonder. Uh, how got real happen. real dinosaurs hidden in a valley yeah. in yeah. California. There. Well, there are people. There did, are they, are did they clear this with Actors Equity though? Can yeah. we bring one of those to? But they did have they did have a little trailer at the end. Uh, no dinosaurs were. were, were <laughs> <very good>. <laughs> <laughs> I had a cousin that worked as a dinosaur wrangler. There are wrangler. some dinosaurs in Washington. There's, there's, a lot there's, of them. there's at least one running for president. Uh, oh. City Council has a couple too. <laughs> yeah. With the kids, though, you might remember something, Bill. They look at you because they're wondering if the folks know what we're talking about. They don't think we know anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, yeah. It's they're, a two-way street. There. They're a religious group. I think they're uh, they call revisionists or something like that, and they think the world's only. Eight thousand years old or something oh like yeah, that. Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and they keep yeah. on thinking that uh, dinosaurs co-mingled with human Came beings. Man. Yeah. Well, they uh, probably watched the Flintstones or something. Uh, like the that. world was created in the year four thousand and forty-four B.C. At yeah, what yeah. time? Yeah. Though? And and do you, do you know? Did you yeah. see yeah. Jurassic <laughs> World? I didn't see the latest usher. one. I saw you know the first one. I saw the first one. This this one here, there was a. Uh, it, it it wasn't a romantic uh, thing, but but the guy that was was the 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 head uh, uh, actor in the redhead. Did you see anybody see it? Jurassic World. Mm. And there was a redheaded. Uh, I don't know what she was in the in, in this. She had something Rhonda to Fleming? do with it. No, this was Ron Howard's daughter. Really? Oh. And I, uh, uh, you know, when we got out of there, my daughter Beth said, uh, "How'd you like it, Dad?" I says, "Well, I was waiting for uh, for uh, that guy uh, that Opie. was the uh, the head of it." Um, the macho guy, I says, I was waiting for the love scene with him and the redhead. And she looked at me and she said, don't you recognize that redhead? Here it's Ron Howard's daughter mm -hmm. who, when when uh, I, I ran up, when we were doing backdraft, uh, he was here and he was uh, taking in a lot of things. And uh, I took him around and uh, this kid was just, you know, <laughs> 
four foot tall at that time. Yeah. <laughs> well, she sure, she sure uh, grew up uh, to be a gorgeous uh, redhead. Yeah, Ron, Ron Howard's got a long career in movies. He's, oh, yeah. He started oh, out yeah. like well, five years old or something like that. He's a like music that. man. Right. Even bef- yeah. even bef- I, think, I think that's even before the Andy Griffith show. What's that? Yeah, the, the music man. man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. The music yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah, well, I tell you what, he was something when when we took him around. I had a, I was running a, a retirement party at that time, and uh, which my daughter put together, and he used everything from that in <coughs> backdraft. What he in learned the, in the party in yeah. backdraft. Yeah, he now, he did the same thing, and he was just marvelous. Before, before we break here, talking about film and watching old old film and whatever, uh, and. The amazement that like Opie has a grown daughter, right? Is that what we're thinking yes, of? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was watching. I don't know what channel it was. I caught a real old western last last week sometime. I don't know, two in the morning, and Gabby Hayes was in it. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah this sure. movie. This movie was so old that Gabby got the girl. That's the movie. On that happy note, I hope. Right. Oh, Tom. You're where listening are you today? to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. Friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. Phil will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price lists, NCR forms, cell sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And his services include one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And he also has a complete bindery service which includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, See or call Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. And once again, they are located at Madison Street and Clarence Avenue, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And it's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, or call 708-383-3638. And ask to speak to. Now back to our show. What were we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, we were. We'll get back to our Civil War, but we should do a little more on the uh, current events. Um, you think the Blackhawks are going to win? Current events. We had. Uh, once again, we had a, a, another, I mean, you know, I for one, I'm a little tired of every time there's some incident out there where some goof who happens to be black uh, does something like that back in, in it was a couple of months now ago in, in Virginia at a bar, they would let him in the bar or something, and they make a big national incident out of that. I mean, if that happened to me or you or Bill or whoever, they'd say, what's wrong with you, Ryan? Don't go to that bar there. Go somewhere else, right? Mm-hmm. But this makes national news, and this can't be helping anything. Anybody got any thoughts on that? I mean, I... I you know, you don't. We don't have enough time for my thoughts. Oh, well, well, we have plenty of time for your thoughts. Uh, uh, we got an hour and a half left, almost. <laughs> Let's put it this way: there, there's two uh, exacerbators of racism. One is the newspaper, the other one is the government. Yeah. Well, you got two people who want to use politicians in front of God and everybody. Exacerbators, oh. as opposed to 
Yeah, yeah, or <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're right. Uh, people in the news want to have a sensational, they don't want to have a, let the <coughs> facts tell we have a good story. Why didn't they go out in Ferguson and, and, or, or in Baltimore and uh, interview the people who are afraid to go out at night? You know, there's you know, they're, they're good citizens who were there, who, by the way, were victimized. Their places were burned. Well, yeah. Businesses then, were burned. Well, then our our immediate uh, uh, notice right here in Chicago would be Chirac. Yeah. And what happened there. And, uh, of course, they gave in. They still yeah. had that party. Yeah. Um, if, if they hadn't, if that alderman hadn't signed off on it and yeah. they had that party... Yeah. Uh, I think the police would have been very, very busy. You're, you're yeah, right. and, and it would be the police right. fault, too, right? Yeah. When another thing would be the police fault. Oh, absolutely. Do you, right? re absolutely. you remember just a few weeks ago, there was an incident in which a, uh, a black, an, an assailant shot and killed the officer. I believe he shot and killed him. The officer was known as the hero police officer, an officer oh, who yeah. had, had been highly decorated for heroism, and he was shot and killed, I believe, in an right. incident. Right. And the media never mentioned race. Now, the officer was white, and the assailant was black. Mm -hmm. And there was never any reference. The only reason you would know the race is because they very briefly showed a picture of the assailant. It was uh, just for a second on the screen. Mm -hmm. But whenever it's the reverse situation, it's always reported as a white police officer, mm -hmm. you know, right. shot or shot and killed a young black well, and it's getting too. Uh, Race is only a factor the, the, when it's the when the it goes one way. The normal thing for the yeah. for the media to do now. Race too. is not newsworthy yeah. when the when the victim is white. Yeah. Right, Pat. Yeah, I have a thought on this, and this is probably going to get me banned uh, in uh, half of Chicago. Hmm. It occurs to me that since the our Afri African American brethren feel that they are so mistreated by white officers. I would think the logical thing to do would be to have their communities policed by black officers and, uh, you know, let them deal with their own. My suspicion is you're going to have the same complaints made by petty criminals against their own, mm -hmm. but it would no longer be a racial issue. And I realize that there are the, that are people are going to say, oh, Butler, you're trying to go back to the grand old days of segregation. I'm not. I'm trying to take a common sense approach to an issue which has been tearing this nation apart mm -hmm. in the past few years especially. And I'd like to see an experiment where black officers would be uh, deployed to predominantly black communities. White officers would be predominantly deployed to white communities. Let's see what happens. Well, you remember in that in the Baltimore incident. What? Mm. There's also, in a large city like Chicago, the FOP, the sergeants, lieutenants, and mm. so forth, have a union. They're unionized. Mm -hmm. and, and there are rules that have been negotiated over the years, and that will never happen okay. because well, of, just because of that. Okay. Now, I, I agree with you, you know, I, I, I do agree with you, but it's just uh, not... Uh, uh, you know, realistic uh, for that, but it should be done. I okay. agree. Uh, with that. The catch on here, though, it did ha there was cases where there are black officers out there, and they're harder on the blacks than the whites are. Exactly. Well, we hear that all the time. I don't know if that's yeah. true. They can, they, 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 there's not that racial component if yeah. something happens, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But uh, speaking of someone with 34 plus years on the job, and as I said, I. Quite a bit of it was in the most high. Did you work those days? No, I hid. No, I hid. I was I was hid at city hall. I was over at the de detailed old St. Pat's Church. I was in the uh, what you call it? No, I was out there. Whatever dirty job there was, a guy like I got because I had nobody going for me. But anyway, having been uh, there from the time I was a very young kid, you talk to most of the people. That's not their attitude at all. They want the police there. They're happy to see you. They always talk to someone with an axe to grind. They talk to the activists and, yeah. the, and the, the publicity uh, hounds. Yeah. And the, but I, with the incident in Baltimore were a number of police involved. I think the media was heartbroken when it turned out that half of the officers who were accused were black. Which is immaterial anyway. Yeah. It should be. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. But oh. to the media, it's not him. No, my no, my not point them. is that to sure. the media, it's the meat yeah. of the story. See, uh, I mean, uh, for God's sake, um, uh, a wrongdoer is a wrongdoer. If he's black, white, green, orange, from Mars, from wherever, he's a wrongdoer. 
Incidentally, as a member of the media, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I mean you. <laughs> no, no, there were there were two groups that were mentioned. Uh, I would add a third group. Uh, there is <coughs> no group that is more crazily skewered on the whole issue here than the universities. Mm -hmm. They have gone mad oh, sure. with political correctness. Oh, sure. Give you Which is answer. really, in, I hate that because it's incorrectness. Well, right. Of course it is. They're not correct. It's you know, death of thought is what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. When you debate. Example. It's political indoctrination. I was, I was covering a story, uh, someone was speaking at North Park University, and I got in line to ask the person a question. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the fact that the guy moderating that program thought no women or minorities had stepped forward to ask questions, that they should find some before I had a chance to ask my question. <laughs> and if I had the initiative to get up there and ask a question, I'm only doing what everyone else could have done. They chose not to. But I was put at the end of the line because of the fact that uh, no blacks or other minorities or women had stepped forward. No one stopped them from stepping forward earlier. Uh, you know, this is the kind of political correctness that is absolute madness. Another time I was giving a talk at another college, and I referred to the American Indians. Ooh, yeah. you would think, you would think I had, I had, uh, you know, flashed or something like that. No. The American Indian Center on Wilson Avenue. Right. Well, that's why Jerry Seinfeld says he won't appear at college campuses anymore because you can't, not, anything you say is going to offend somebody. Right. And, and they have no sense of humor. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I now refer to myself as an Hiberno American. <laughs> yep. I, uh, my girlfriend, I refer to as a Gyno American. Oh, God. <laughs> You know, okay. just to be politically <laughs> correct. Let me let me give you to, to show you the, how far back the, this goes. When I when I was a, a freshman in college in the '60s, I, my, I remember at a supposedly conservative unit, not conservative, but not a hotbed of radicalism, DePaul University. There were flyers all over the campus that a member of the American Communist Party was going to speak. Had been invited to speak right. by some campus organization. <laughs> And I'm walking up the steps going to class with a friend of mine who was as conservative as I was. And he said, oh, did you see this flyer? And I said, yeah, they're going to have some, some idiot communist speaking. And an upperclassman turned around with, <laughs> with, with fire in his eyes. And he says, if that's your attitude, Buster, you better not show up at this rally. Because we, don't, and I, word for word, he says, because we don't want your kind at that meeting. We believe in freedom of speech. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> can, can you admit, except, except for you, you. Yeah. except for your kind. Yeah. I, happen, cool. yeah. I happen yeah. to believe, you know, William Buckley said once that every idea has a right to be heard, but some ideas don't need to be heard more than once. Yeah. <laughs> and communism was one of those that really don't need to be heard over and over again for people to decide that it, there's nothing there that's worth listening to. Mm -hmm. But they thought it was a big deal that they were going to have an American communist. They probably had ten people that showed up at the meeting. But this was a big deal that he yeah. was going to come and speak. They could get one from the uh, the White House now, probably. You know, in the staff there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, rem I remember I was going to IIT. Remember the riots in '68? Do I remember them? Oh, <laughs> baby, anyway, I caused them. No. They had they had the uh, crosses out in the various campuses. What? And I, they had some crosses out at IIT, and I knew a full-time student there, and I asked who put those crosses out, and he said, I have the foggiest idea, we're too busy to worry about that. You know, talking about the students mm. at IIT, because sure. they're engineering students in general. So some liberal college came out there and put it on the campus of IIT. What, what did he put out there? I don't understand. Crosses. Crosses? <laughs> yeah. Was well, a crucifix you? cross? No, I don't, Just yeah, I guess so, I don't remember. Commemorating the, the dead. Yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. I don't know. What's the connection? I'm just talking about the liberalism versus conservatism. Oh, yeah. Uh, Can't even call it liberalism. Now you have to call it progressivism. Wait a minute. They yeah, don't even well, like to I use I the always, word liberal. Always, now what's now they are progressives. I always, I always what's liberal about them anyway? I was always thought I was a progressive conservative. <laughs> <laughs> which, progressive. Which means I, I Canada had a progressive I, I conservative understand, party. Uh, you know, progress. But I don't understand their term for progress. 
Yeah. Well, Bill, do you say something? Do you want to say something? No, no, no. I was going to say, what's liberal about a liberal? Doesn't liberal mean like I'm all I'm for the drown trend? Yeah, it's fine and dandy, but I'm also free to let you express yourself. Originally, in the 19th century, yeah, it had it some of that meaning, but it quickly became the left. I as, mean, as long as you agree with them, you're okay, the left, right? Yeah. As long as you agree with them, yeah. You have that, well, that was the that was why this idiot didn't didn't sense the incongruity. Of, see, we believe in freedom of speech, and we busted we busted out laughing, and he he that enraged him. He didn't understand what we were laughing at when he. Yeah. Well, I believe in of freedom not. of speech. I got a good example when I was in the youth division. I was detailed at Tilden High School one time. One of the regular people weren't there, and the librarian, very elderly lady, a really black lady, is talking to a young girl, black girls in high school, and um, about. Oh, the, the whole gist of it was if she gets pregnant, get a abortion and don't, and that's nothing, it's no big deal, it's just some, just, she says, ask him, ask him. So I said, yeah, you're right, uh, 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 you've destroyed that, you're destroying another human life is what you're doing. Oh, she didn't want to hear that, you know, of course. You know, no. So that was, no. uh, ask him, ask him, you know, one of them. Well, of course, I'm just one of those chauvinist males, you know. I got to tell you, I learned early on in one of my first, uh, stories that I had written of any consequence as a newspaper reporter. I get a call one morning from some guy who didn't like what I had written, and it was a fairly innocuous uh, thing, uh, and he called me the leading communist on the north side. <laughs> <laughs> now, I got to tell you, I am not, nor have I ever been, <laughs> a, a member of the Communist Party. <laughs> Following day, I get another call. From Joe McCarthy. No, <laughs> this is this is from somebody calling me the leader of the fascists. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I know I have done a good job. <laughs> yep. I have apparently uh, alienated both, both groups of nuts. Uh, like I must have done something right that day. It sounds like the beginning of Citizen Kane, where well, they're they, showing that newsreel. Yeah. Charles Foster Kane is a communist, and like Charles Foster Kane is a is a socialist. He's a fascist. Yeah, right. And you have the quote: "I am an American." <laughs> Charles Foster. Well, that's what Hearst, Hearst always called himself the American. You know that, right? But anyway, uh, what you were just uh, saying before, um, the two the two philosophies can't be as that far apart as people seem to think, because after all. Benito Mussolini was expelled from the Italian Communist Party. Yeah, he was a leader of the, of the and he went out and started his own so. Socialist Party. Yeah. The Italian Socialist Party. Yeah. Oh, was it? Was yeah, that the, the Socialist same thing? Party? Yeah. And and did he have ice cream socialist yeah, or what? He was a socialist. Yeah, he they're was they're the editor of the Socialist newspaper. He was. Yeah. And Hitler's party was National, National Socialist. Socialist. Yeah. Workers and it, party. the German Workers Party. Who was the last conservative you know that called himself a socialist worker? I, I'll yeah. bet a lot, of, uh, a lot of input from the workers there, too. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. A lot mm -hmm. of input. yeah I, and Joe Stalin, the communist, the, the vanguard of the people. The, 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 uh, large the vanguard. Yeah. No matter how many million you got to kill, right? my money, they're all on the left. The, the, the fascism, yeah, right. The last they're time you heard left. somebody say that they were a socialist was not too long ago, John. And he was from Washington, D.C. Well, Bernie Sanders calls and himself a socialist. And yes. And He's running for the Democratic nomination for president. And and that's what this is turning into is a socialist uh, uh, regime. Yeah. yeah. Well, well and he's treated as sort of a lovable eccentric. You know, everybody treats Bernie Sanders as he's kind of the, the yeah. kindly yeah. old fellow that just happens to be a socialist. At know. least he's honest about it, though. He's <laughs> upfront yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah that's the one argument in favor of him. Yeah. yeah. They should teach that in college about what a socialist is, what a fascist is. They're teaching is socialism. They <laughs> but but they, they just try. teach the socialism. Socialism, yeah. yeah. The leader of that, of course, is... Uh, at Berkeley, California, University of California, oh. notorious for that. The great Iron Lady said the trouble with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> well, the great Iron Lady, who are you talking Margaret about? Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, I got to I gotta admit, Margaret Thatcher is not one of my favorite people. Well, and I'll tell you why. Yeah, tell us why. You mean that centerfold she did that time? <laughs> <laughs> that would have clinched the War it. of the Falklands? No. Mar no, no. Margaret Thatcher's treatment of the situation in Ireland was about the worst. Uh, it set back Irish-English relationships back several hundred years. Uh, I sometimes wonder if she wasn't uh, an illegitimate daughter of Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> I don't think someone. I don't think someone who is as ardent a Tory as Margaret Thatcher would have had anything to do with Oliver Cromwell. But she had no. She had no choice in the matter. 
<laughs> no, there's no room. You can't. No, there's. You can criticize Thatcher, but you can't compare it to Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> Cromwell was an iron-fisted dictator. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, and, he was. And he was a man. He was a revolutionary. And Margaret Thatcher was no revolutionary. Yeah, he was enough of a revolutionary, in fact. He cut off the head he, of the king when he came off with the penal laws uh, in Ireland. Those were the same laws with a few modifications, which were picked up about. 250 years later uh, by a certain aspiring artist paper hanger yeah. by the name of Adolf Hitler. Cromwell's the Nuremberg laws were the identical the identical oh, laws I, of Cromwell. Cromwell is the prototype for Hitler, for Stalin, for every every 20th century dictator. You my, can, you can the find the origin in Oliver Cromwell. Does anybody here know what this is the 800th? Magna Carta. That's right. Well, yeah. Magna you, Carta. Jen, you got it. You Magna win the. Carta. Yeah, you said it this morning. Today is an, today is an octocentennial, Carta, which is actually the the basis, the foundation, the basis, of the foundation <laughs> of our laws. British uh, and American, the whole exactly. concept of however, liberty and exactly. representative however, government. However, however, the Magna Carta had nothing to do with the lower class. It's mostly to do with lords yeah, and barons. Right. Right. But it was the point. It was. It was. Start. It was the beginning was the of the start. idea that 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 the, even the king was not absolute. That there were there were yeah. laws that he had to respect in relationship to the lords, to the church, mm -hmm. and that was the beginning. And even t and even to the ordinary Englishman, there's there's there are the, the origins of that in the Magna Carta as well. Yeah. Because no, some I of those that. rights apply to everyone in England, although he was negotiating with the lords. And King John yeah, knew what, what he was doing. He was he was yeah. their leader, and he knew. And he, what had was doing. He, he, he had his back to the wall. He had he didn't do it willingly. Yeah. He, was, no, he had to no, grudgingly. King, no. That was King John. Then after he was Prince John. Yeah. Same guy, right? Yeah, after he, Richard yeah. got killed. And yeah. and yeah. after yeah. trying yeah, to deal John with Errol Flynn. They Prince John was not known for being a nice guy. No. They actually uh, good had King Richard and bad King John. It was around 1978 or 79. They had the Magna Carta here at the library downtown. Right. The original. Yeah. Original. Was it the was original or was it a very very good uh, duplicate? Oh, fake. Yeah. <laughs> there are there are a number of there are a number like of that. of the early the, there were certain copies were deposited around England, mm -hmm. and a number of them are still in existence. They're I in can't various believe cathedrals the original was. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, they, they, the paper they used I didn't that see time it. was it was vellum. Yeah, it was, it was vellum. Was, uh, yeah. lasted forever. Last forever. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But maybe no. animals can. It wasn't before. like the paper that you know, nineteenth-century paper, which is all crumbling to dust. No, well, wait a minute, nineteenth-century paper. It, late night. 20, well, twentieth century is even worse. Yeah. 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 Because uh, if you've ever looked through old so, yeah, papers, oh yeah, I'm thinking the, at the end of the century, the beginning oh of the yeah, 20th, yeah, when you when start with yellow and all, yeah, that all the up. all that. Yeah. If you yeah. have a book made in like 1890, and that's it's all crumbling now. You got a book made in 1850. That's it's that's still fine. Yeah, fine. Today. That's right. That's right. A comic book, old comic books fall apart too if you don't take care of them. Huh. But today <laughs> is the <laughs> eighth eight hundred eight hundredth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. June fifteenth, twelve fifteen. Well, that and the uh, the Mayflower flower compact, compact too, but that was just for women, right? Compact. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and incidentally, Tom, <laughs> dump, dump, Tom. June 15th, please, <laughs> please. June fifteenth, eighteen fifteen, was the day of the Battle of Waterloo. Beginning of the battle. Hmm. Yeah. The, the climax okay. was the eighteenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. June eighteenth. Wasn't there a song? Waterloo. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Where yeah. you there? Yeah. Waterloo. Where was Waterloo, by the way? Waterloo Belgium. Street, uh, it is in Belgium. South of, yeah. south of Brussels in Belgium. Hmm. And it's a, it's a, probably the, the greatest land battle prior to our Civil War. There, there were probably as many, roughly as many casualties at Waterloo as in our Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That was the old, the old uh, line marching against another oh, yeah. line. And yeah. The French lost over 30,000. They had about, about 25,000 casualties and 8,000 captured. And the combined British and Prussians lost about 25,000 dead. So, the, so the, there was pretty close to the casualties, 50,000 at the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, for you young folks out there, that's... Prussian with a P, yeah. Prussian, which is yeah. a German, one of the yeah. German kingdom. Yeah. Prussia, yeah, what, yeah, Brandenburg, one of the other ones. Bavaria, Bavaria, Bavaria. Württemberg, and yeah. Hess, Saxony. Where the Hessians came from? Mm -hmm. yes, uh, Hesse, Hesse was not a kingdom. Hesse was a uh, grand duchy. 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 Oh, a grand duchy? Well, grand duchy. Mm -hmm. Saxony was a kingdom. Bavaria was Bavaria. a kingdom. Württemberg became a kingdom. And Prussia. Prussia with a P. And Hanover. 
Hanover, over the five Ottawa. kingdoms. Do you have a Hanover? Hanover. I also got. A, oh, I got fun. their insurance. What's funny though is uh, England is primarily Germanic, and the Queen of England denounced her uh, German. Uh, you can't relatives. say that England is primarily. I mean, England is a mixture of Celtic, uh, yeah. of the Anglo Saxons, the old Gallo Romans. I mean, England is. is Angles and England Saxons and, and Jutes. Oh, oh my. Angles and Saxons and Jutes. Oh my. Angles and Saxons and Jutes. You just gotta throw a few Picts in there, too. Yeah, Picts <laughs> and Scots. They're the Celts. Yeah. The, the Welsh. The so England is a. Is a, a mix, but they, mixture. but the language originated from the uh, English is sex. a Germanic yeah. language, yeah. yeah. And they also the current the current royal line. Uh, I mean, Queen Elizabeth and her forebears, uh, going back to the time of the Stuarts. Uh, Queen Elizabeth and her forebears were, uh, you know, basically Germanic. Mm -hmm. Well, since the Stuarts, before the before before, before well, the House of Hanover Stuarts. came in after the the Stuart dynasty. That's right. Such. Yeah, the first one being George the first, who never bothered to learn how to speak English. But, but in this yeah. in this century, I mean, there's this has changed because of you know the the marriage with uh, you know the the Queen Mother who was Scottish. Uh, Princess Diana, you know, there's there all these other bloodlines are in the royal family. Well, so you yeah, can't really say the family is well, completely Germanic. Yeah, go oh, not completely. You gotta go back to uh, Vic, 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 Queen Vicky there and uh, Prince Albert, and that's where a lot of the royal uh, family came in too. Well, for a time, for a time, the British royal family married into the German because they were the only Protestant royalty in Europe. Right. They, they couldn't yeah, marry yeah, into yeah. the French royal family or the Spanish or the <laughs> Austrian. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they or the Russians were Orthodox. The only the only Protestants were either in in Scandinavia or in Germany mm -hmm. or the yeah. Dutch. Now they were out of royalty altogether. So now they're marrying the commoners, and they sure know how to pick them. Yeah, <laughs> you better believe it. Well, <laughs> yeah, to get a little beauty in this world lines, yeah, right? Well, <laughs> all I gotta say is, you uh, ever see some of those old time oh, royal my God. people? <laughs> yeah. oh, they got yes, I have seen them. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Is you you ask uh, the English what they think about uh, Charles, and they all cringe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that oh, I, I've, I've talked to, I've talked to people in England have the entirely different attitude. They said that at the time Diana died, all the press was anti Charles. It was primarily young women in England that didn't like Charles because okay. they thought he was the typical <laughs> bad husband, bad boyfriend. The opinion in England was never as, as, as wholeheartedly in favor of Diana as our media led us to oh. believe. Well, that might be true, but the, the fact that the, fact the, the BBC was, was <laughs> deluged. I, I, was I talked to some people, a British, who said the BBC was deluged with complaints at how one-sided the coverage was, at how, mm. at how unfairly critical of the Queen they were being. Mm. They didn't report any of that. Like our media, mm -hmm. they just ignored any opinion that didn't go along well, with Well, she's, she's such a model mother and all. She's out with her boyfriend while somebody's watching the kids at yeah, home. And all mm -hmm. kids. I mean, mm -hmm. God damn, you know, God bless that. The rule side. generally was I mean, guys supported Prince Charles and the girls supported Diana. It was yeah, about a 50-50 split in England. But n no one wants to see anybody you know, die, die like that. I mean, a uh, no, tragic situation not. no matter what. But I mean, uh, no, to, what, to, to, to sanctify her. Well, there was one sign that someone was holding at Diana's funeral. Diana, born a princess, died a saint. Well, that's mm. believe it or not. I mean, yeah, and, and, and that was she was no saint. Mm -hmm. Isn't that isn't that like typical of uh, the way someone's remembered? Though I mean, uh, the Kennedy administration wasn't exactly uh, super uh, successful so far, and yet when the assassination happens, yeah. you know, Martin Luther King was was like falling out of favor with an awful lot of the leadership, and he wasn't invited to some conference was there. And then the assassination happens, and they all want to be part of the uh, assassination uh, eulogies. Do wonders as far they as all want to be part of the show. Best That's career it, yeah. move the camera. for any president or major figure is to be assassinated. Consider the fact that Lincoln, during his time as president was a very controversial president and the newspaper cartoons if you look at them mm -hmm. yeah. from the whole political spectrum i mean he was depicted as everything from an ape to uh you know a uh, super thief and all kinds of other things monster yeah. yeah then you had 20 years later a guy by the name of james garfield who was a political hack who had like buchanan kind of worked his way up by being going along to get along mm -hmm. getting along to go along he was a non-entity he became president 
largely because of the fact they couldn't find anyone else pliable enough uh, <laughs> to do that. He gets shot. All of a sudden, you know, it's uh, St. James of Garfield. But it did, mm -hmm. in the case of Garfield and McKinley, it doesn't last. Yeah. It does not last. I mean, they were by my year ago. McKinley was looked upon; it was almost deified right. at the time. Mm -hmm. But right. it was quick. I mean, today neither Garfield yeah. nor McKinley is remembered as much of anything. I mean, just other than the fact that they were assassinated, yeah. and right. you learned yeah. that they were the presidents who were assassinated. Yeah. But nothing yeah. comparable to what happened. Yeah, and in Lincoln. of course, in McKinley, you know, the 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 legend is 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 actually further enhanced by the fact that his dying uh, words, mm -hmm. as he was laying in bed, half delirious singing the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, which almost became a second national anthem for a while, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, and then, of course, the Kennedy, this was brought up earlier, Kennedy had his faults, but right after he was assassinated, there were even people wondering if maybe they ought to begin the process of looking into seeing if he could be canonized. Mm. Well, I, I, wasn't I heard that. this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah, that was so something. That Cardinal wrong. Cushing was, was looking into the idea. Mm. One thing I wanted the, to say, though, um, about Lincoln is that as controversial as Lincoln had been during the war, having won the Civil War would have elevated him into greatness, even if he had not been assassinated. John? Mm -hmm. Do you remember there was one uh, theory that Abraham Lincoln is Jewish, really? Was Jewish? Yeah, His name was Abraham. Abraham and no, no, he was shot in the temple. Yeah. Oh. oh. That was, that was, that was We're Jack We're going to be Lyon right later. back <laughs> after these messages of interest and importance. <laughs> <laughs> Hey friends, do you need an awning over your front, side, or rear door, or your windows? How about a canopy for your carport, or a patio cover over your patio so you can enjoy being outside in case of rain in the warm weather? All you have to do is call Awnings and More, and Raphael Bogus will drive over measure up whatever you need, and go from there. You can call Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1111. Or if you need an awning for your windows or doors, call Raphael Bogus at Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Raphael also installs hand railings for your front side or back steps. You must be safe when you go up and down the steps, especially in bad weather. So for awnings or handrails, call Raphael Bogus at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Call today for a free estimate. Now back to our discussion. Okay. We're talking about the assassination of Lincoln. Uh, again, uh, forget about the joke, but anyways, they claim that if he was shot in modern times, he would have survived. In because Lincoln's case? No. I oh, who says know. that? That was claimed. No. I don't say he would have. Garfield yeah. McKinley, yes. No. Okay. Yeah. But well, the, there was some claims to that effect. Uh, <laughs> well, that's right into his brain. That's true. Food for, food for thought and conjecture. The back of the head here bounced on a bone inside the head and then landed right behind the mm -hmm. eye. Mm -hmm. The brain would have been damaged mm -hmm. irreparably. Yeah. It's amazing how he lingered for about eight hours after. Yeah. yeah. Now, getting back to that, we should finish up strong with the Civil War again in Chicago. Uh, was there um, was there's a lot of, uh, would you know, um, uh, Pat, 
a lot of uh, sympathizers in Chicago? Yes, with there the were. You mean Copperheads? Sympathizers? Oh, yeah. Copperheads, Copperheads, they call them? Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that uh, there was a problem uh, locating Camp Douglas where you did, because this, this city had a pretty vocal Copperhead component. Remember, not everybody was in favor of the Civil War. Uh, there were people who felt well, Lincoln that wasn't in favor of the Civil well, War. No, I mean, well, no, but I mean, Lincoln once, wasn't looking for once, once the once the fight started, there were people who felt that uh, we were being, we the American people were being dragged into a war, which could have been avoided, and there wasn't, there wasn't uh, uniformly. Various groups were not too happy about the war, mostly the poor, because as soon as they instituted the draft, Before they that. also instituted a way to get out of the draft legitimately. If you could come up with three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, now that's three hundred dollars in eighteen sixty-two money. Which was a lot of money. Which was a lot of money. What are we talking about today? You think? You'd be you'd be talking you'd be talking about maybe twenty five hundred three thousand dollars. Well, more than that. Well, I'm more than that. Well, well, I'm more than that. Using conservative, that. I'm you got to look at uh, estimates. Uh, 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 living wage at that time was about eight nickel an hour. Okay. But uh, the average worker was making three fifty a week. Yeah. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. an enlisted soldier uh, in the uh, <laughs> Union Army was making very good money for that time, $12 a month. Both Theodore Roosevelt's father and FDR's father took that route. They, they paid a substitute yes, to, uh, yes, to get in. Yes, they did. One of, probably one of the reasons that Teddy Roosevelt was so enthusiastic about getting into the Spanish-American War is he felt, he felt somewhat, he wasn't, he, was, <laughs> he deeply loved his father, but he felt that, that, that he wanted to prove that, that the family, that someone was going to go and fight. Sure. Bully, and bully. FDR felt the same way. He tried to get into the service a number of times. Yeah, uh, he tried during the Spanish-American War right? to enlist in the Navy he as an enlisted man. He wanted to go to Annapolis. And Who's that? FDR. Oh, for mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was only 16, and he wanted to get into but the But he, he was struck with that infantile paralysis in, as an adult, right? He wasn't oh, yeah, he was, he was he, he tried very hard to get a commission from the Navy during World War One, and mm -hmm. President Wilson said, you have to stay where you are as Assistant Secretary mm -hmm. of the Navy. He, mm -hmm. kept, he kept pestering. He wanted to get into the service all during the First World War, mm -hmm. and yeah. they would not permit it. But my, my point is, they both had this desire to serve in uniform both of the Roosevelt's mm -hmm. and part of it may have been because their fathers had not well they both yeah, knew their well, fathers had not Teddy was also the fact was he was sort of a very weak kid when he was growing he up had asthma. Yeah. and he had to prove asthma yeah he was uh, had to prove himself and that was one of the ways he wanted to prove himself right and he did he was the only he became the only president in our history to win both the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously. But it took him a hundred years. It took him a hundred years to get it and uh, to uh, get the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Which he got, you know, while he, he was still alive. Well, he also well, started he, a National Park Service. Didn't he uh, mediate war between Russia and Japan? That was, was that what it? Got yeah, that's what he got the Nobel Prize. Yeah. That's yeah. what got him the Peace Prize. Yeah. 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 But, Ports, but the Treaty of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. That's right. right. That's right. Hmm. But the yeah. uh, he was he was recommended for the for the Medal of Honor in 1898, and for political reasons, right. he was yeah. not. He, he would. There's no question he was entitled to it. Well, see, no yeah, question. But he was see, he was to. see because he was not a regular. Right. He was a volunteer, mm -hmm. and because of the fact there were a lot of people, Teddy Roosevelt, by all accounts, was an easy person to like. And an easy person to hate, <laughs> and uh, so no in between, huh? He didn't have he didn't have too many friends, but you know Teddy Roosevelt put his Quit money. Quit talking about me, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy don't have any friends. Put his money okay. where his mouth said. is. What what really uh, iced it for him was that he he, after the war was over, he thought we should get our troops out of Cuba as quickly as possible before they all came down with malaria, mm -hmm. because. And he criticized the War Department for not getting the vet, the soldiers back home, and actually the War Department didn't like that. And it got out into the press. He wrote the congressman whom he knew, and that was what killed any chance of him getting the Medal of Honor in 1898. There was one other thing also that didn't exactly endear Teddy Roosevelt uh, to the powers that be. When he was able to wrangle himself a commission as a lieutenant colonel of volunteers, 
with the help of his friend General Leonard Wood. Um, when the ships landed in Cuba, the men were on one ship and they had been issued winter shirts, heavy woolen winter shirts for Cuba. Yep. The horses were on another and the saddles and other equipment were on another. Those three ships landed about 20 miles apart from one another once they were in Cuba. Had there been uh, a well-organized Spanish resistance, <laughs> they would have been cut to pieces before they even had a chance mm. to land in uh, in Cuba. I mean, it was it was one of these... And Teddy Roosevelt, of course, criticized the War Department and everyone else, which, again, this was not the kind of story... They never, they never got... The Rough Riders did not ride at San Juan Hill. No, the they only, didn't, because the, the horses didn't The, the horses, horses didn't never arrived. On the yeah. only one who was on horseback was Teddy Roosevelt, and, and, most and, of the and time, he dismounted very yeah. quickly in the, in there the, you in go. the attack. Yeah. Well, the other, the other thing, too, is... Cuba, I don't think, was really wanted to get into the war in the first place because when the Maine blew up, a lot of the Cubans helped rescue people off the Maine. Well, the Spanish. You mean Spanish? Yeah, Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. yeah, the Cubans were yeah. fighting for their independence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the one six one or the other. But the fact was that the Spanish did help them. Take yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. They did help the the Americans that were. And the Spanish also offered to indemnify. Yeah every family of every man who was killed when the Maine blew up. Now, apparently, uh, what was in the original report, but which did not get played up much in the months that followed before we actually declared war, it was about a two-month period there, um, there was the suggestion that the explosion may have been caused by uh, cordite, decaying, a, a decaying element uh, that's used in uh, gunpowder, yeah. and that may have, you know, been the cause of blowing it up. Certainly, the Spaniards had no interest and no reason to blow up the battleship Maine. The rebels might have had an interest in to doing it. To provoke a war between America. Yeah, yeah. but because uh, they were trying to bring Americans into the war, uh, but again, there's no evidence actually uh, that they did that. Well, On the other hand, it's easy for guys like William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer and a few other people to uh, beat the drums and get everyone to believe to the point where the slogan was by April 1898, remember the Maine to hell with Spain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there was actually a waiting list to get into the army But the, Span the Spanish government made a blunder. They, they, there was a, a diplomatic cable that they sent that found, got its way into the press. Senor in, de Lom's telegram. In which yes. they spoke very disparagingly <clears throat> of America in general and of McKinley in particular, referred right. to him as a low-grade politician, I believe. Mm -hmm. So well, the fact that they were being so insulting towards America and the presidents fed into the idea that they were behind I mean, it was easy for people to believe that they were behind mm -hmm. the sinking. What, what the was the, uh, the other thing they said? They, I think they believed they sent uh, deep sea divers down to look Today at the they main. think the coal might have been. They think the no. the, the coal might have actually com might have been combustible. The coal. Well, the coal they, they they claim that I heard was the fact that the furnaces are right next to the cordite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when it blew out, it blew out. In other words, they show it. It wasn't anything going into the ship was everything going out yeah. of the ship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what was the quote? Was it something about, uh, was it William Randolph Hearst wanted to you someone to write about atrocities you down you there or something? provide the pictures and, and I'll, I'll provide, provide the, the war. war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was kind of paraphrased in Citizen Kane. Remember yeah. that? When His yeah. reporter says there is no war in Cuba. And yeah. He says, you provide the pictures, I'll provide, provide the, the war. war. Yeah. But see, what they were, they, were, well, they were manufacturing stories about atrocities being to committed by Spaniards. Spanish officers raping uh, yeah. Cuban maidens and that sort of thing. And then they ran one picture uh, showing a Spanish soldier on the front page of a newspaper. Women, hide your children from this image, for this is the image of evil personified. They yeah, those had, are the exact words. There was a, the Spanish had a governor of Cuba, General Valeriano Weiler, who was known as the hum, Wire, human the hyena um, and, the, and yeah. the butcher, who was not a very uh, citizen-friendly governor. No. And so, again, again, the Spanish made mistakes and blunders that, that contributed 
to the belief in America that these were evil people and we had to go down there and throw them out. Sounds oh, like ISIS. Yeah, was, yeah. I think it was, uh, well, World War One or maybe a Spanish-American war. They said the war will be good for both machinery and for the news <laughs> <laughs> or you know, industrial complex as such because the money you generate to produce the war goods and the newspapers to generate the propaganda. So how long was this war? Well, it lasted, let's see, it started in uh, February and uh, the Treaty of Paris was uh, signed, I believe, in October or November. We don't declare war till April the 25th. Right. Well, the main is blown up in February, right. but right. we don't so declare war. I mean, You're McKinley right. was not hot for war. I mean, it took, no, took, it took two yeah. months for, for McKinley to ask so for a declaration So much so of war. that, as a matter of fact, McKinley was told by some fire-breathing members of Congress that <laughs> if he did not send a war message to Congress, uh, there was the possibility he might be impeached. impeached. Mm. <laughs> Seriously. And you yeah. get a, you get a, what I like is you get a, a former, conf former Southern officer fighting Joe Wheeler, who's a United States congressman who gets commissioned as a major general, I believe, a two-star yes. general, and he's Teddy Roosevelt's overall commander in the uh, in the uh, the Battle of San Juan Hill, and Wheeler is noted for sometimes forgetting which war he was fighting because he'd be hollering at, at these soldiers saying, get out there and get them damn Yankees! <laughs> yeah. And all these soldiers from New York and Pennsylvania saying, you heard the general, let's go out and get them damn Yankees! <laughs> and there was another general, Joe Wheeler at least had some military experience. Joe. Yeah. There was another general who was a political appointee. This guy was about 250 to 300 pounds, which was a big man oh, in yeah. those days. Yeah, he was Wheeler's he, immediate. He was between Wheeler and Teddy Roosevelt. Right. He Which couldn't. He couldn't uh, even get on a horse yeah. without yeah. massive assistance, and in some cases, they couldn't find a horse strong enough yeah. to hold him. Yeah. Didn't have any Clydesdales, did they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He was a thorn in Teddy Roosevelt, but Teddy Roosevelt had a good relationship with with Wheeler, who was his superior. Right. Yeah. 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 And, of course, there was also General Leonard Wood who was uh, involved there. He had been the colonel, and he becomes a brigadier general. That's how Teddy becomes a, a bird colonel right. just before the charge at San Juan. Yeah, Hill. yeah. And Teddy was quoted by some news correspondents at that time. During the battle, uh, supposedly uh, one of his men was fatally wounded, and Teddy didn't realize the guy was fatally wounded. He goes over to the guy who is laying against a tree, you know, trying to hold himself together, and Teddy says, isn't this the greatest day of our lives? Yeah. <laughs> and the soldier said, uh, yes, Colonel, even if it is my last. Mm. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, mm. there's no question. Teddy Roosevelt does not become president of the United States if not for that one day at San Juan. Yeah. His crowded hour. That propelled him into the governorship of New York, and from there he gets bumped into being vice president. They thought they were burying him there, I suppose. Huh? Yeah. He was being kicked upstairs to get rid of him mm -hmm. by the New York politicians who had had enough of him in the governor's chair, little thinking that, that William McKinley is going to be assassinated a few months after the beginning of his second term. Mm -hmm. And if modern medicine had existed at that time, McKinley, McKinley would have lived, probably right? oh, would yeah, have lived. Yeah. On the other hand, if Ronald Reagan the... had been shot in 1901, he, would have he died. surely would have died. Yeah. Good yeah. point. It's that all a matter of timing. Yeah. Sure. Well, Ronald Reagan, uh, they didn't really make much out of his assassination at once. Once we're realizing the, uh, now it was much serious than yeah. we were led to believe serious. at the time. For a while, yeah. we didn't know he had been shot at all. Yeah. Well, he 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 was quite an actor too, and he. he well, he uh, played the part. I think that this is a man in his 70s, the fact that he bounced back. I mean, it's a yeah. credit to him as well. He was in good shape. Yeah. 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 He was in very good shape. I like, I like the, the panache of the guy where he is being wheeled into the hospital uh, emergency room and he says, uh, I hope you guys are all Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that one. <laughs> the, lead the, doctor the, said the lead doctor who was a Democrat says, we today, today we are, Mr. President. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, local guy Tim McCarthy was on the president's little detail. He's the one that charged with his arms up in the air. Ooh. He's mm -hmm. chief of police of, uh, is it Tinley Park out that way or something? I think no, it is like Tinley Park. I actually worked for his father. Norm McCarthy was a sergeant wow. at Old 48th Street. Wow. This guy looked like, if you're uh, at Central Casting and you want to see an Irish cop you know, sergeant in Chicago, 
he'd be him. Broad shouldered, ruddy complexion, silvery hair, you know. That was him. I'm sure he's gone now, but it's uh, I'm but talking about Homer. No, years ago. I uh, I saw him. I talked to him uh, four weeks ago. He was at uh, Tim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy. Oh. He was he was at the city uh, club of Chicago when uh, the uh, police superintendent, uh, Superintendent McCarthy, no mm -hmm. relation, mm -hmm. uh, was speaking there, and he was he was one of the guests. And I talked to him after the luncheon was over. He's more like Charlie McCarthy to me. <laughs> <laughs> so which one, the superintendent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, what do you think well, about that? Well, well, well Bergen. <laughs> well, you got to remember, all superintendents are political hirees. So they're, well, yeah. They're, they're on a short leash. But they I should like be. this uh, new order that they came out with that no tattoos will be shown and yeah. Yeah. get rid of the uh, baseball, baseball caps cap. and, the, and the, the watch caps. And uh, yesterday, talking to... Uh, couple of people at the police mass uh, one of them was the one that signed the order to wear the caps hmm. and the other one was the guy that that had contacted me about the fire department wearing wearing uh, baseball caps and yeah. they were both very uh, upset that that this was being overturned because it lent a lot of uh, you know, uh, j just a lot of goodwill among the men. Uh, well, I, I don't agree with that watch cap. I think well, the watch cap is the stupid. only practical thing to wear in a Chicago winter. Well, yeah, they, 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 they yeah. have they what have the that watch? Russian. I don't know what do they mean. Is that the, that fur well, cap with the foot? No, no, it's a wool cap. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, oh, like, okay. like a sailor. Yeah, it's from the navy, right? It's a sailor. Okay, and it's got CFD on it and that. One thing I know is the other cap that they got is that Russian. Cap you with gotcha. the, the yeah. cuddly dudley hat. Yeah. 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 yeah, And who the oh, hell is going to wear that? Well, that's uh, been I'm more than we can wear your shield on that too, one. You know, yeah. is that? Yeah, that's yeah. Really that, that's been around a long time. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the trouble yeah. with that is, if in the spring when it gets a little warm out, you get really hot under. Well, you don't wear it. <laughs> well, you don't wear <laughs> it. Only yeah. for winter. You're not yeah. stupid. You but know, yeah, wear, you wear the cap. It's for the winter. baseball cap. Yeah, but you know, you got the transitional period of time, and usually. Transitional time depends on the temperature. Right. There, there is the thinking, though, that a baseball cap is for baseball and that it yeah. doesn't yeah. represent the authority of a police officer. I've, I've always tended to that thinking, that a baseball cap simply doesn't convey the authority that the military cap, the service cap, does. For but the there's got to be some... I know it's more comfortable. There, I'm, I'm there's sure got to be some uh, answer for this in the middle because time was if you got out of the car without your hat on, then we're going to get a day off. Oh, oh yeah. And yet some I see hat. guys on a detail oh, yeah. directing traffic with no hat on or something. You some know. bosses were, were just, and on both sides, some bosses were just yeah, idiots cap. over this yeah, thing. I, I you know. mm -hmm. I uh, like Jack says, you got out of the car, you had to have that on. Right. Yeah. You know, that's nonsense. I, I remember, it has nothing really to do with this, but I was working in a water department, and this guy's wandering around the hallway, and I asked him, you, you know, need any help. And he t his uh, deputy uh, commissioner, he was lost. <laughs> You're walking around. The deputy commissioner what? Water, water. Okay. Uh, plumbers. Oh, the actually. hallway. You couldn't pass water. Yeah. Yeah. He was a. Pl it was a deputy commissioner <laughs> of plumbing or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Throck Morton P. Gildersleeve, <laughs> water commissioner. I, I never saw him again. But the, where's my office? <laughs> I, I think he fell, fell on one of the filters and nobody missed him after that. <laughs> Leroy. <laughs> anyway, we're trying to get back to, to the Civil War. Yes. Uh, okay, Copperheads we were talking about now. We'll, we'll continue this after the break, which is still about eight minutes away. But uh, Copperheads, was there any sort of... Uh, well, there's an old, it's a film based on a real incident, I believe, called The Raid. Did yes. you ever see that with Van Heflin? Yes, yes. These, what they, they do is they collect a bunch of uh, southern boys to go on to Canada to come back across as if they're... Canadian. And, this, and this actor, Robert Easton, is in it, and he said, read this. He goes... I am a citizen of Canada. You know, the big tall blonde guy who mm -hmm. used to do dialects too. I said, no, you'll never do, you know. <laughs> but anyway, they, what they do is he represents himself in there and they, is it, do they, is it a prison? Or do they break out or just a raid on the town? Uh, they were raiding the town. Yeah. And it, it is actually based on a real incident that occurred mm -hmm. because there were several uh, small units of Confederate soldiers in civilian clothes 
uh, who went into Canada, and their job was to conduct fifth column operations behind the Union lines. Mm -hmm. And they, the thinking was that uh, if they came behind the Union lines and uh, wreaked all kinds of havoc, it would have a great deleterious effect on northern morale. Uh, it did not because most of these attempts were nipped in the bud uh, before they, I mean, there was a plan to burn down New York. They had Confederate agents in New York. They were going to burn P.T. Barnum's uh, museum. Among and, other and things. And hotels. And yeah. There was well, no Empire State Building no, for them but, to go but after. Was, but, uh, uh, you know, that was not... Uh, uh, I mean, P.T. Barnum's museum, were they considered the, the main landmark in New uh, York they, City? The only catch with that, of course, if they got caught, they could be shot for spies. That oh, was sure. it. Mm -hmm. That's true. But, you know, if, if, if you were in a uniform on a battlefield, you could get shot any day of the week, too. Yeah, but this mm -hmm. one was so, more direct. So you were taking, you know, you were taking that risk by uh, being in the service to begin with. The thing mm -hmm. that's always puzzled me about the Civil War and about fifth column operations, Chicago was the railroad hub of the North. Right. Mm -hmm. Chicago was also the meatpacking hub of the North at that time. If I were a junior officer on the Confederate general staff in Richmond, I would have proposed the idea, why don't we send some people up to Chicago, blow up the railroad yards, blow up the stockyards, have thousands of cattle stampeding through the streets of Chicago, then follow that up with the release of prisoners from Camp Douglas, followed by the release of prisoners from Rock Island, which was an officer's prison, you could have delayed the war, by, uh, the end of the war, by at least a year. But the, th right. the thing, what I would say in response is, then as today, if you want to strike at America, the first city you think of is New York. Right. Even more so in some ways than Washington, it's New York. Yeah, it's because New York is the biggest, it's the center of everything, and people think if you strike at New York, you've struck at America. Well, the eye, the more eye so of the than nation. Chicago or Philadelphia but or Detroit when you or anything. Oh, I strike at Chicago. I'm not you denying strike what at the belly. Oh, I'm not I'm not denying it. But no. but these decisions are made as much from emotion I know. as they are from, I know. from logic and I know. reason. Well, Which is probably are. why in the Confederate Army I would not have gotten any higher than second <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> You know, I just, uh, I, I'm just looking at this article, and it said that fearing a prisoner revolt at Camp Douglas, a military official declared martial law in Chicago, mm -hmm. and civilians, including the Chicago mayor and his family, were arrested, tried, and sentenced. Yes. Who, uh, which was that mayor? Uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but what happened was his wife was an active supporter of the Copperheads. She was allegedly shielding Confederate, escaped Confederate prisoners in the basement of their home. Uh, he was involved in a few clandestine operations, but nothing that could be directly connected uh, with uh, any treasonable act. She was locked up for a while. <coughs> uh, he was held and he was released, and eventually, after the war, uh, he was relocated, shall we say, to Kentucky. Uh, was he from there originally, maybe? Or uh, no, there? as a matter of fact, he was from so, Ohio, I believe. Yeah. But see, you had you had a lot of you had a lot of sympathizers. For example, you had a U.S. senator, Clement Vallandigham. Vallandigham. Yeah. Clement Vallandigham in. In uh, the Senate, U.S. He's a, Senate, was a congressman. Was he a congressman? Congress. Okay, <clears throat> in the in the uh, in Congress, was constantly making speeches, you know, urging a settlement with the South, even during the heat of the war. Finally, they decided that if Mr. Vlandingham liked it that much, <laughs> they took him and arranged for his transfer Dumped him at the border, <laughs> and he went down to I think it was New Orleans. Hmm. Uh, for the duration of the war, he couldn't. He couldn't come back. He was a congressman when they did that. Yeah. He was a congressman. He's a member of the U.S. From Congress. Ohio, I think. Yeah, I think but I mean, what, was under arrest and put down there? Or he was arrested, oh, and was arrested. he was he was sent to. Uh, uh, they arranged under a flag of truce to transfer him to uh, Confederate. Uh, 
control. Mm -hmm. You know, always the funny stories you hear about some truces, as temporary as they may be, was, uh, I believe, it was during this Revolutionary War where they called a truce and uh, one side went in the river and took a sh uh, bath, and th then they, the other re they withdrew, and the other side came in and cleaned up, and then they came back, and they started shooting at each other. That kind of thing mm -hmm. happened in the Civil War, too. Yeah. Yeah. There were incidents like that yeah. in the Civil War. The First World War. World War, War, War I, like the, great, yeah. the Great Christmas Truce. Yeah. 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 1915. The other funny uh, story about World War One was, of course, Lily Marlene, which was an mm -hmm. international favorite, was written by the Germans, and they were supposed to be uh, getting royalties and they withheld royalties until the end of the war because of the fact they could not give royalties to the Germans. <laughs> well, when the movie Casablanca was made, the Germans were supposed to sing in the, the, the famous scene where they have the face-off between the French and the Marseillaise. Mm -hmm. The Germans were supposed to sing the horse vessel lead, which was the Nazi anthem. Oh, yeah. Rather than Die Wache am Rhein, which is, an old, Rhine. which is an old imperial song. Which Watch was, on the Rhine. Yeah, which was not the, the national anthem. No, it was no. banned, actually banned by the Nazis, because Hitler didn't, didn't favor anything that went back to the days of the monarchy and the mm -hmm. Kaiser. Except him. But the, 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 legal, the legal office at Warner Brothers said you can't use the horse vessel song because the, the Nazi party owns the copyright to it well, <laughs> and we, we could be <laughs> the litter this is literally yeah. true they said we could be sued we're at war with Germany 1942 we could be sued by the Nazi party for infringement well. of their copyright <laughs> besides John horses can't vessel yeah that was the, the it was horse vessel was a man and incidentally do you know that oh, well, uh, excuse me now we're gonna have to make another break well, and we'll be right back after these messages of interest and importance Sounds just like Gerald Moore there, doesn't it? That is a true story. I know. Well, the other, I mean, I didn't know about the worst of us. How are the tires on your vehicle? Do you need motor oil? or transmission fluid, or power steering fluid, or antifreeze? How about the wiper blades? Are they in good, sharp condition? Is the windshield washer fluid in your tank full? How good is your battery? Do you need re to replace light bulbs? Well, the place to pick up all these items is at Berkeley Auto Supply at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Stop in and see Tom, and he will get you any part or supply you might need for your vehicle. He has every tool, part, and supplies you might need from the front bumper to the rear bumper, from the top of the roof to the bottom of your chassis. You can call Tom at 708-544-8350, and they are located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Tom's hours are Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and he's even open on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's Berkeley Auto Supply, 5237 St. Charles Road, and he is just east of Wolf Road and west of Mannheim Road, about two miles on the south side of the street. Call 708 544-8350 for parts, tools, and supplies. It's Berkeley Auto Supply. 708-544-8350 and he's located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Now back to our show. <laughs> Pat, I wanted to ask you, with all these Copperhead plans and movements in the Civil uh -huh. War days, how much of them do you think were really thwarted by the Pinkertons? That many some, of these some were not as many were. as maybe we like to hope. We think some you know. some were. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, Pinkerton. Pinkerton, <laughs> incidentally, he's buried here in Chicago right, at right. Uh, Rose Hill Cemetery or right. Graceland Cemetery. Graceland Cemetery, yeah. Graceland. Uh, yeah. The and, private uh, You know, Pinkerton's a kind of a complex character. Uh, as a person from a union background, uh, a longtime member of the Newspaper Guild, etc., 
Uh, obviously, I don't particularly like his uh, uh, labor busting tactics. However, however, uh, during the Civil War, he was probably uh, the best tool that Lincoln had, both in terms of keeping Lincoln alive and also in terms of gathering information. Uh, he set up what amounted to the precursor of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, not riddled by the usual, you know, political stuff. And he brought about him, for example, the first woman detective in the United States, yeah. who was on the train yeah. with Lincoln when he went Michael. when he went from Springfield, uh, when he went from Springfield to Washington. Uh, she looked like an ordinary housewife, except that she was uh, packing uh, one or two guns and knew how to use them. She later doubled as a spy, uh, along with a guy by the name of Timothy Webster. And these people actually uh, infiltrated uh, some of the best cocktail parties in Richmond, which are great places to get information. And she was caught, as was Webster. The only reason they were hanged was because we had just hanged a Confederate agent by the name of Sam Davis, no relation to the president. It was no longer a gentleman's war. Prior Jefferson to, Davis, you mean, right? Yeah. yeah. No, not the, not, yeah, President not, Jefferson. Not the real yeah. president. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, and it was no longer a gentleman's war where prisoners would be sent back in due course with the promise not to be bad boys again, that kind of thing. Oh, you mean kind of like with, uh, 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 what's his name, Berg Bergdahl and the five traded, you know, five traded Taliban top ladies? That was a good deal, wasn't uh -huh. it? I mean, yeah, you think of that before. We get well, one, that's a we get one that's guy. A program in itself. I know. Go ahead. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so because Sam Davis had been hanged, uh, the Nathan Hale of the Confederacy, as he's referred to down there, <laughs> they decided they needed to make an example of these Yankee spies. But, you know, Washington, you talk about Copperhead activity in Washington. Washington was sort of the Lisbon of the Civil War. You remember during World War II, Lisbon was the network place right. for spies. You had spies of every description attending... Uh, cocktail parties and dinners and that sort of thing and you know a pretty lady uh, over serves a general uh, it <laughs> is amazing uh, how talkative what this guy is of information to can yeah. be picked oh, yeah. that's, that's, that's right that was one way they always did it yeah yeah Mother Hari was notorious for that too <laughs> yeah and incidentally that was World War incidentally Mata Hari was not that good looking uh, <laughs> no. of a person. Uh, Neither was Cleopatra, so they say. That's what I understand. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, so. <laughs> great so there great was, beauties of history weren't. <laughs> I mean, somebody <laughs> needs to write a book one day on not the battlefield civil war, but the espionage aspects yeah. of oh, the yeah. civil that would war. Be something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, Pat, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, go here because we're getting to the, that point. Uh, this is from 2007, uh, well, it's from 2014, and I read, The formal site of a Civil War training and prisoner of war camp on the south side of Chicago has received formal recognition. The site once housed black soldiers who were recruited for the room Union Army as well as Confederate soldiers who were captured during the war. It was once a part of Camp Douglas where about 6,000 Confederate soldiers died there throughout a four-year period. Mm. The property is now owned by Prologue Incorporated. When it purchased the land in 2007, the Alternative School Networks Network agreed to open a Civil War museum that honors black soldiers. The future museum will be developed by the Camp Douglas Foundation. I, I take this as uh, very offensive, that it is just going to be for black soldiers. This is no longer the and case. There, it is no, not. This is no longer is not, the case. Okay. There is going so to be a Camp Douglas was, Museum. Yeah. This was yeah. a, a separate okay. group entirely. Um, there is going to be a Camp Douglas Museum. 
The museum is going to be built uh, in the form of a barracks, hmm. okay. identical to the type that the prisoners lived in. And there will be another there'll be another barracks next to it, which will be an actual barracks. So uh, that has changed. Now it's going to focus on the prisoners who died there, the, the whole business of prison camps during the Civil War, mm -hmm. how they got that way, why they got that way, and also, <coughs> you know, yes, they trained black soldiers there. They also trained the Chicago Irish Brigade. So there is going to be, uh, there's going to be something on that too. Because uh, remember, uh, cities throughout the country, not just Chicago and New York, sponsored Irish brigades. And uh, at the end of the war, General Lee was asked by a reporter after the smoke had cleared, how is it that the Southern armies, with probably the better generals, probably the advantage of geography, yeah. and a number of other things, uh, how is it that the uh, South lost the war? And Lee said to this reporter, uh, well, Mr. Lincoln had more Irishmen than I did. I doubt that that's true because you had Irish and Germans who fought on both sides. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that the Irish brigades not only were more visible, uh, but they were the victors at the end of the war. Remember in the yeah. film, uh, more recent film, last well, 10 years now maybe, Gangs in New York yes, portrayed yeah. a sh scene where the Irishmen are getting off the boat and just down the line they're being inducted into the army and it probably wasn't much different than that. It was, you know, obviously that was compressed. It was actually true. The story in our yeah. family is that my great grandfather, whose name was also Patrick, who had to leave Ireland. It's in my a grandson's hurry. name, Patrick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Imagine that. Who, Imagine who that. He had to leave Ireland in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he uh, was getting off the boat and. So the story goes, the sergeant said, hey, Patty, come over here. <laughs> and he supposedly turned to one of the guys that was with him, and he says, my God, I've only been in this country a minute, and they already know my name. <laughs> so uh, we're perfect. We're, 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 we're in our family, we're not pacifists by any means. We just don't want to stay at the bottom of the heap. So he asked the sergeant, what do I have to do to get a little something on my shoulder? And the sergeant said, can you read? And he said, yes. Can you manage people? He said, yes. He said, tell you what, you sign right here. <laughs> if you're alive a year from now, you'll get that chance. And sure enough, he lasted a year before they came around, largely because no one else in his group was still alive at the time. The mortality rate you know, of soldiers in the field was pretty high. Yeah. And uh, so he got his chance, became an officer, uh, left the army a captain, and he supposedly often said that if the war had lasted longer, uh, he might have come out a lieutenant colonel. Mm. <laughs> you know, because they were promoting people so quickly. Because once you got the job, chances are you were going to be dead within six months. Because naturally, snipers would look for who? The officers. officers. Mm -hmm. The one oh. thing, one one quick. That's comment. why I never wore a white shirt. When you talk, okay. when, <laughs> when you talk about the, the the South having having the better officers, I w I would disagree with that. But the one thing point I would make is that North or South, you have to remember, all of them went to West Point. They were all Americans. Yeah. Well, this is all of them. Well, the North regulars. The South, they regulars. were all, yeah, yeah, not all the officers yeah, the regulars, in the whole yeah. war, Obviously. but those at the top. They were all West Point graduates. They were all Americans. I mean, I think Grant and Sherman and Sheridan and Meade and Thomas were uh, more than a match for for the Southern contingent. But but uh, the thing I, w I wanted to take, I want to have one minute. This, we talked a little bit about the uh, the Magna Carta. And yeah, I know we've got time. It's, it's, we've got time. Please uh, take more than a minute. We've got time. The, the important thing for Americans is that the Magna Carta is not just something that's important from English history, British history. When our founding fathers were beginning their struggle with with England, it wasn't with the crown. It wasn't with the king. It, it comes down to us as the colonists fighting against bad King George. Yeah. But for right up until 1776. The colonists professed their loyalty to the king. Their problem was with Parliament, parliament. Right. 
and they were asserting their rights as Englishmen. They were asserting their rights right. under Magna Carta and everything that had flowed from Magna Carta. So Magna Carta was very important to our founding fathers because it was the basis of, of, of liberty and representative government and limited government. And so that's why, you know, for Americans, if, if it's on the news tonight, I'm sure there's going to be uh, ceremonies in England because this is an 800th anniversary. But it does, ha it does have a significance for us uh, because of the fact that our liberty traces to the Magna Carta. In fact, I remember being in Washington, D.C. when they had, Mar this was, and this goes back to Margaret Thatcher, she had sent one of the copies of the Magna Carta was in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. Uh -huh. And I'm standing there looking at it, and a couple of fellows come up and they say, look at that. The Declaration of Independence, <laughs> and I and I I politely said, well, "Excuse me, I said this this is nice. This is an English document called the Magna Carta, which is the basis of our Declaration." They of didn't know what you were talking and about. And no, no, he says, "No kidding." He's, "Hey, Bill, come over here." You know, so Bill comes over. He says, "Tell Bill about." It. So I'm telling Bill about it. Pretty soon, a crowd gathers Jeez. around me, <laughs> and I'm giving a I'm giving a free lecture in the rotunda of the Capitol about the significance <laughs> of Magna Carta, and one of the Capitol Police officers standing there, and I kind of apologize. He says, don't apologize. I was listening, too. It was very interesting what you were saying. The other thing I want to say about the Battle of Waterloo, the significance of the Battle of Waterloo is there isn't another general war in Europe for a hundred years. Right. I mean, when they, when, when Napole it's the final defeat of Napoleon. Napoleon goes to St. Helena and dies. And the European powers don't engage in a major war again until the First World War breaks out almost sure. exactly a mm -hmm. hundred years later. Mm -hmm. So it did bring a hundred years of relative peace, which mm -hmm. enabled America to grow and prosper because Britain ruled the waves, and there was no country in Europe that was strong enough to challenge Britain. And we kind of grew to maturity for at least the first half of the 19th century, in part because the Royal Navy was out there safeguarding the Western Hemisphere. That would make a good song, wouldn't it? Britannia rules the waves. <laughs> I, I may, I, I think that's an idea. Let me write that. Down. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I'll send it to London, and maybe who knows? Send I'll sell a million copies. Here's You're an absolutely interesting right. Article. We Americans seem to forget that it was the British Royal Navy uh, which safeguarded our ability to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. Sure, for at least the first half of the 19th century. Because we sure so did not have War. a big navy no. at that right. time. No. Right, right. No. Here's an interesting article, and in, in getting back to uh, the Civil War here, and uh, the 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 uh, burials out at uh, Camp Douglas Oakwood Cemetery. It says as many as 1,500, besides the six uh, the the 4,200, were reported as unaccounted for. On the other hand, and this goes right back to Chicago, historians discovered that unscrupulous contractors buried some crude, empty coffins in the relocated graves to increase their profits. Mm -hmm. What does uh, that sound like? Yeah. What does yeah. that sound like? In the aftermath mm -hmm. of the war, Camp Douglas eventually came to be described as the North's Andersonville, Andersonville. Mm -hmm. for its poor conditions and death rate of between 17 and 23%. The death rate was lower than at Anderson, and its conditions were better. An it exact does, it counting is now side, impossible no. because the best estimates, which place the number of deaths at about 4,454, and the percentage of prisoners who died at about 17 percent, appear to be reasonably accurate. Wow. Yeah. Uh, right now, and Pat, uh, it says here that. Uh, the premises now is uh, a local funeral home built on the site, maintained prisoner records and a Confederate flag at half staff. The business closed December 2007, and in 2012, archaeological work at the site was conducted and since 2013 has continued mm -hmm. on a <coughs> biannual basis with help from college students from DePaul. Right. Mm. Uh, as well as other volunteers, a group called Camp Douglas Restoration Foundation, founded and uh, formed in 2010, 
hopes to spur the development of a permanent museum on the site. Okay. Oh, there, there we go. And incidentally, I'm proud to say that uh, mm -hmm. uh, with also help uh, from a reporter or two who were doing a story on this, mm -hmm. and when we were finished with the story, uh, you know, helped with uh, some of the uh, digging, and uh, I look forward to doing that uh, again sometime uh, this uh, this summer. Well, so, the, yeah, yeah, they do they do archaeological digs over uh, where they dump the ashes from the uh, Chicago fire periodically. Mm -hmm. You don't see too much of it, but they still dig down once in a while because that's landfill and the trouble with that is it's it's a lot of it's covered over so it's hard to dig but uh that was this uh what was it king james they found in the parking lot in england no that was king uh, that was richard no, the third richard the third richard the third of the they richard Burton? incidentally a first class <laughs> funeral yeah. yeah uh and uh you know it, it was he was he was buried in the fashion that a king would have been buried in Richard III's time. And they shared the service between the Catholic Catholics. Church and the Church of England right. because, of course, he was a Catholic right. before before Henry VIII. But since, of course, now the Church of England is the, the, church, is the church of England, they came to an accommodation that both churches but were represented at his service. Oh, he was so not, just, he was what, not too was popular month, either. Wasn't it? What? It was just last month. Yeah, yeah. a yeah. month, month and a half. Uh, like, yeah. A couple of months ago. Yeah. 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 But interesting, interestingly enough, the Catholic Church uh, and the Anglican Church in England have probably for the past hundred years been gradually working more and more closely yeah. together. Oh, sure. mm -hmm. You'll notice at the, uh, at the funeral uh, of uh, Princess Diana, you'll notice there's one point there where uh, Prince uh, Charles and his sons are crossing yeah. themselves. Yeah, I noticed that. Which would not have happened a hundred, hundred and fifty. Her brother, years ago. Her, her brother convert. Her brother is Catholic. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the Earl. Oh, they, they, I'm not sure. The there's not that much difference between the Anglican Church and the Catholic yeah, they, Church. They're close. They're from all. They're they're very close in, in yeah. many in many respects. First would be recognition of the the, uh, the Bishop oh, of the, Rome the, as the leader. Of course, yeah. the Pope. In terms well, yeah, of in terms of their doctrine and their the rituals. The doctrine, the ritual. The fact that they have archbishops, exactly the you know. Same. And, yeah. Well, f funny you should mention. I was laid up with one of my surgeries. I don't know how many years ago now. Christmas Eve. It was it was videotaped, but here was midnight mass from wherever it was. It turned out to be from the National Cathedral, and I'm watching the whole thing at the end. And it says. A production of the Episcopal Church of America. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. Did oh, I sure. commit a sin by doing that? <laughs> yeah, the some oh, they, Episcopal they, they, they ministers call themselves priests. Yeah, yeah. They oh, yeah. The term priest. Oh, they yeah. are priests. Yeah. Yeah. What's the oh, difference? And, yeah. and it's funny when you we have a a uh, chaplain on the Illinois State Police who's a woman, and she is called Father. Oh, yeah. really? Yep. That's, uh, yeah, that's that strange. I find that's strange. Yeah, yeah, it is I, strange, I find yeah. that to be strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They should work the, uh, on that. No, yeah. It, yeah. well, you got to remember the reason why it really split off because of Henry VIII because he wanted to get divorced. Oh, oh yeah, right. right. You know, so basically, there's other than the fact of the the breaking off well, from he, Rome. Because Henry VIII always considered he died believing himself to be a Catholic. Oh yeah, he died believing yeah. himself he was a Catholic. Yeah, well, he thought he had just taken over the government of the Church in England, but he felt everything else was the same. He still yeah. considered mm. himself a Catholic. Oh, boy. Yeah, he, he was a real prince, wasn't he? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> divorced, well, they, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded. But he was survived. doing. He was doing what a lot of kings and princes in Europe were go, uh, doing at that time. Remember, around that time, there had been wars between, literal wars, between the papacy and oh, sure. the Austrian uh, uh, monarchy, well, he, and they actually sent in 1526. They actually sent uh, an Austrian army. Uh, into Rome, and the Swiss guards, the right? The Swiss guards uh, fought to the last man, almost, to allow the Pope time to escape through a series of tunnels, so that he wouldn't be captured by the Austrians. Yeah. Well, they, they, they also had the papacy uh, states in Italy, and essentially right split down to the, the papal century. states. Essentially, yes, yeah, essentially split the. the well, Italy uh, was a it, collection it, of kingdoms yeah, and yeah, principalities. They split, split the boot yeah. in half, basically. You Pretty ever seen the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy? Yes. It begins with that battle, and you see the leader of the army, and when it's it's Rex Harrison, and when the battle is over, they take his armor off, 
they put the triple tr. He's the Pope. It's Pope Julius II, yeah. and he celebrates Mass yeah. in the center of the city. He's just conquered after leading the army with sword uh, in hand. There's another scene in that same movie where Rex Harrison, in full armor, in gold-plated armor, yeah. incidentally, is leading his, you know, passing his troops in review, kind of an inspection, and instead of saluting, they cross themselves. You know, well, it, if you go to if you go to the Vatican, there they do have a, still have an escape route for the Pope to leave. Oh sure. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, so uh, so, uh, so the Jewish population doesn't uh, get at them. That's all. Well, he, well, it's like they they, they tried to vilify uh, uh, Pope Pius the Twelfth, and here he saved all kinds of people three thousand four yeah. down in down in the catacombs like that yeah but i was gonna oh, i should save this that for the was end. in our time well, the swiss well, guards were prepared to defend him if the nazis had ever yeah. come across yeah. The, yeah. The, the borders yeah. well there are incidents too where the italians didn't go for this messing over the civilian population like the the fat the nazis were and yeah. uh, jewish population were actually defended by the army there mm -hmm. so and another another thing is uh okay i'll say it okay don't why is there a tavern next to saint peter's in rome Gee, I don't know. Why so is the, there? Well, Mr. Bones, yeah. Da -da -da -da. So the Pope has a place to cash his paycheck, you know. Oh. 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 Terrible, huh? On behalf of Tom McKenna. I that, just was, that was Jack Ryan. I think I was just gentlemen. excommunicated that time. <laughs> that was Jack Ryan, ladies and gentlemen. Again? <laughs> but uh, another little, uh, a little footnote to many of you young listeners, if you're still out there with us, may not understand it. Our reference before to the movie Casablanca. And, uh, the greatest movie ever made. And the, um, I, think well, I, I thought it was like. Dandy myself, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the dramatic device is used in Rick's, Rick's Cafe while Sam, the, the, uh, the uh, piano, player. piano player, is on break. The, the Germans take over the piano and they're singing this Watch on the Rhine song. Watch on Rhine. Yeah. <coughs> so, and then um, Victor Laszlo, the Christ-like figure <laughs> of the, uh, of the yeah, underworld, yeah, yeah, won't yeah, you say yeah, so? Okay. He gets up and he starts the band playing La Marseillaise, yeah, La which Marseille is the, is. the uh, national anthem of Spain. And they drown out the other guys. That same director was, um, what was his name? Michael Curtiz. Curtiz. He used the same um, dramatic device in Dodge City, although hmm. the southern boys weren't singing <laughs> La Marseillaise. <laughs> <laughs> it was... Uh, uh, marching through Georgia by the and the good old boys were singing Dixie and they drowned them out. So, <laughs> as Ann Sheridan is singing it up on the stage, and you look up all these people and somewhere you'll find the name in books. So anyway, uh, we did a pretty good job of covering both bases today. I think, don't you, gang? Uh, yeah. Both the current events. We got a couple other wars in there, but we really did a good job. I want to thank you, Pat, and uh, I'd like you to come back sometime. I'd love to. Please, really. Please. Well, let's hope you mean it. We did the Magna <laughs> Carta and Waterloo. Because, well, I mean, our interest isn't limited just to Civil War. I don't, I don't know. I don't <coughs> know. Are we coming back here? I don't see <laughs> a... Uh, we'll be back uh, on June the 15th. June the 15th, yeah. Oh, what year? June the 15th. Yeah. Beware the Ides of June. Oh, boy. <laughs> Is that, uh, do we take that for a hint, John, or what? To change it. Oh, shame on you. So it'll be, we whatever, be back on the whatever third the Monday in July. Which will be, let me think now. Hmm. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, it'll be 20th. July the 20th. July the 20th. The 20th. Apollo Day. That's the day we landed well, on the moon. Well, it's, oh, yeah, it? it is. You're right. Apollo yeah, the, the moonwalk. That was the, the landing of the John, uh, here I've got something for you. We still have people two, uh, two uh, swearing. Still people Prince swearing Harry. that that was staged in a tele television station uh, studio or something, right? Oh, Prince George. Eh? What's that? The, the uh, older son was King, uh, Prince George. Prince George, yeah. Yeah. He was born on my birthday, so I know. remember. Ah, you got a royal connection. Well, you yeah, know, well, and then the I, royal I, connection I, was Dole was born on my same time. Queen, uh, was uh, Queen was born on April the 21st. My birthday is April the 20th. When is Prince so Albert? Uh, uh, got Prince Albert in a can? <laughs> in a can. Yeah. No, we let him out. Well, that's a good joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, Governor, uh, Tom, please come back next month. Bob Newhart uses that joke, and they all denounce him for ridiculing the royal family. Yeah. Bob Newhart in one of the Newhart shows. Really? Yeah, he tells that. He, he's stumbling for a joke, and he tells that joke about Prince Albert in a can, and all the, all the village elders, all the, the town council... Well, I don't think that's very funny, making fun of the royal family. <laughs> they're all, they're all, they're all snooty a, about it. How, well, look how at, dare you that, insult that the British royal family? That was a joke when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, well, it really has whiskers on it, huh? What about, what about this uh, Kirk 
Senator Kirk making oh, this oh. thing today. Oh, it's, what it, you know, it's, yeah, it was yeah, stupid, it's but joke, you know, no, even better, a big thing out of oh, it. even better with yeah, Mark yeah. Kirk. What was that two months ago now? That business in the uh, Memories Pizza down in Walkerton, Indiana, where they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, cater to a homosexual marriage because they'll be taking part of the uh, ceremony. No. Then they didn't say he wouldn't serve somebody if they came in the place. And they made a big deal nationally they, about it. They wouldn't make a cake or something. Yeah, no, like they would. They, yeah, right. Okay, they wouldn't yeah. be part of it. Yeah. Right. If okay. You were coming, we'd have so, the cake. Uh, oh, so anyway, um, uh, Kirk comes out with a written statement that anyone who feels this way is uh, bigoted and un-American. Well, I take offense to that. Yeah. You, you, in other words, you can't take any uh, um, alter position correct. to something. Mm. Right. You once once it's back to the death you're of thought bigot, and you're discussion. You're with hate, and you're probably a boob to boot. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like. Um, um, very famous. <laughs> Come here, Kate. A well, a well-known um, TV personality stated that. Um, Anyone who was uh, opposed to our president now must be because of uh, bias, well, Jimmy racial Carter, bias. Jimmy Carter said anyone who didn't vote for Barack Obama in 2008 yeah. was or would, would be a well, white who didn't vote for him would be racist. Well, to I me, to me that would be like... The only reason not to vote for him would be racism. To me, I that would be like saying, um, hmm. well, when like Idi, Idi Amin was in charge there yeah. in Uganda, oh, if I'm opposed to him, am I racist or am I just uh, I do think it's boob? a good rule for public officials, though, that you can be a public official or you can be a comedian. You can't be both, right. and you can Sometimes get in a lot of trouble trying to be both. Yeah. What, wow. what did uh, was it? Mark Twain said, "Suppose I'm a politician. Suppose I'm an idiot." Wait a minute! Now I'm repeating I myself. Repeated myself. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's about rounds us up to the end. On behalf of Bill Kugelman, John Kuschelko, Rich Lang. I know your name, Rich Lang. Long live the Duke of Wellington. Al Lopez, and, and our special Pat guest, Butler. Uh, Pat Butler, and myself, Jack Ryan, and our. Our, our spiritual leader in the booth over here, John DeVita, I want to remind you that history is much more than the book you keep on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Three cheers you, for Jack. the Duke of Wellington. We wish to thank Kevin of Jack FM, WRHS 89.7 FM, for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening via the internet at www.windycityhometown.com. We also want to thank the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, John Seconda. On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians program, we thank you for listening. See you and so long until next time. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, June the 15th, the year of our Lord, 2015. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and a special thanks to our executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. Until next time, please be safe. And thanks for listening. Have a good day.